Welcome to Senate Education Start of the Week this Tuesday, February 13th. And we are starting uh, with Ms. Uh, Delneo. You don't mind joining us. Uh, trying to get in, start a little early each week so we get out a little early. Also, given that it's um, chairs meetings on Monday. So, appreciate you coming over again and following up on your request. We are talking about S303. And you had mentioned last week when you were in one of the side chairs that you'd like to come in and talk a little bit about different parts of the business. So, with that, please, let us know with your thoughts. Sure. My name is Catherine Zalino. I'm the state librarian and commissioner of the Department of Libraries, and I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you about S303, an act relating to supporting Vermont's young readers. And um, I wanted to share with you that the department's supportive of S303 as it relates to extending the Advisory Council on Literacy through June 30th, 2027. Um, I did prepare some remarks very late. I think that um, your liaison put them into your your yeah, right, 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 right. So I'll just um, I'll keep to the keep to the remarks. Um, the council is charged with advising the secretary of education and and right now others on improvements to proficiency outcomes and literacy for students in pre kindergarten through grade twelve and how to sustain those incomes. Oh, I'm sorry, those outcomes. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. I miss no, 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 no. read. Embarrassing for a state librarian to misread. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, given the role that public libraries play in supporting pre-literacy, the department respectfully requests that the state librarian or their designee be added to the council's ex officio membership. Our hope is that adding the state librarian or their designee to the advisory council on literacy will enable the department to be part of the conversation about a holistic approach to literacy that starts as soon as a child is born when they are issued their public library cards, when their parent brings them to the library. Great. So let's just pause there for a moment. Sure. So um, we might, we have like counsel here with us. So you want, uh, you want you or uh, the designee to be on as an ex officio member. Why ex officio? Um, because it matches, so I was looking at page 5, line 12 of yeah. the bill, and if you go to the last page of my prepared testimony, you'll see what we were suggesting. Um, in the past, there had been, uh, last year, uh, the former Secretary of Education had reached out to me about serving on the committee in one of the other roles, and there wasn't really a spot for the state library. I see. And um, because I don't have a child, I couldn't serve. So it, it seems like there is a role all the time for the state librarian or the youth services consultant. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to ask you, tell me what you mean, you don't have a child, so you're not allowed to serve? The only open positions were for oh, parents. I see. So um, that wasn't really, the, the idea of being an ex officio member is really looking at the role of the department, how the department supports public libraries specifically, okay. because public libraries support parents and caregivers and guardians in beginning kids on the road to reading success. So when we, when I was here last Friday um, and, and we were looking at the learning platform and we watched a small video, they talked, the, the expert in the video on literacy talked about pre-literacy and how you need the fundamental building blocks at the beginning. Mm -hmm. If you jump in at kindergarten and you haven't had any pre-literacy activities, you are already behind. So the public library is for so many Vermonters bridging that gap at the beginning that may exist. Um, parents often haven't been to a public library, haven't been to a library, haven't thought about a picture book, a board book, a nursery rhyme, or a song for children since they were kids themselves. And they have to be reminded that that is actually, it's not just a tradition, it's actually fundamental to language acquisition. And that repetition of syllables, the learning and the hearing that goes on will actually help the child later on when they get to the point of learning to decode language. And the science, this point for many years, has supported early childhood literacy as the foundation. And um, I have had a long career in <laughs> children's services. I was a youth services librarian. I have a school media specialist, mm -hmm. master's degree for library science. 
and I served as a children's librarian and then a middle and high school, uh, middle and high school uh, public services library, public library um, staff member. And then I was a branch manager slash children's librarian. So I've got probably, gosh, 15 or 16 years in children's services and delivering those programs to myself and have had the great experience of having training such as Every Child Ready to Read training, where the librarians are taught the principles, the science of early childhood literacy and how playing and singing and talking and simple things that parents can do every day at the grocery store, just talking as they go about their day, how that's going to support a child in learning. And so when I look at the, the council, um, I see that we've got a gap. We have the birth through pre-K, and in many Vermont communities, there's not a pre-K. So we have the birth through pre uh, through kindergarten years. So the kids who don't have parents who are, the kids who aren't fortunate enough to have parents who are really reading up on that, don't have such a great entry point to literacy, and they may have a lesser outcome when they begin their elementary school careers because they can't identify numbers, they can't identify letters, they haven't been hearing the repeated, um, the repeated rhythmic language through children's literature. Their parents might have some books in their home library, but they don't have a practice coming to the public library every week. And their parents don't know how to read the books with them. We don't just read the book. At the library, we model an engaged reading practice. So the librarian reads and pauses, and there's some interaction with the kids. And that's really what a parent should be doing at home if they're trying to really have reading comprehension, which is a building block of literacy. So when we look at the role of the public library, my, my point is really that somebody from the state library where we have trained professionals, we have a youth services consult consultant. We also have me currently as the state librarian, but not every state librarian has my background. And that's why I thought the state librarian or their designee would be a good way to do it. Um, we have, people who have experience in this realm and who leave continuing education programs for public librarians. And um, we have a, we have over the years had a relationship with VLI, the Vermont Early Literacy Initiative, which is a part of Vermont Humanities, training a cohort of learners. And we give a grant to humanities to support VLI. Um, but I feel that we need more than that. So this year we're launching a series of trainings for every librarian in Vermont who wishes to take them on the science of reading, how to build story time and really serve as a model for the parents, but also an educator using plain language that people can understand. Um, you know, when we talk to a parent and we talk about phonological awareness, they start bleeding over. <laughs> and so really trying to, to meet the parents where they are, meet the caregivers where they are, um, even I'd like to get to the point where librarians in our state have the training that they need to go and serve as a, a resource at a local preschool to teach a preschool re uh, teacher how to read with kids. Um, I know that this is something that hasn't been done as much in Vermont, but in the framework that I came from previously, both in New Jersey uh, and Somerset County Library System and then in San Francisco, we did a lot of professional development around the science of reading. And that's the type of thing that I think could be helpful on the Literacy Council, just having that framework and starting kids at that birth point with a, with a public library card, with access to hundreds, thousands of books, with access to library professionals who are helping them to select books and utilize those books. And every book, one book's not perfect for every kid. So going into the library and doing that matching and being exposed to all of the, the books in a story time is so important. And I think that for us, kind of leveling up the skill set of the practitioners in the field, giving them what they've asked the department for through the working group report, they really asked for more training for youth services librarians, many of whom don't have a degree in library science and master's degree, but they want to learn. Uh, they're doing great work now, just naturally and through their community's practice, but we'd like to support them in growing that further at the department, and, and we'll begin that this year. Um, but really thinking about it as a constant, and that's really why my recommendation would not be to add somebody in a kind of rotating role, but to have some continuity from the department so that this doesn't fall off the, fall, fall out of mind again, because I think it 
probably should have been there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Any objection to this request? Great. And I did check with um, with Agency of Education and, and the Interim Secretary and, and her team were supportive of, of this addition. That's cool. Great. Please, yeah. with your testimony. Well, I think I just said it all. Oh, it is. Great. <laughs> okay. no, great. I great. Really, yeah, I, um, I'm happy to talk with you more about it or answer questions you might have about what, what public libraries can do great. and what we'd like to see them do. Um, but I think I covered the high point. So if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. But I don't, I know you've got a lot of your notes today. It's great. If you don't mind sticking around. I'm happy to stick around. That'd be yeah. great. Yeah, please introduce. Thank you. Oh, Catherine, oh. I just have one quick question with a little preface, which is that you just made me get a little misty eyed mm -hmm. as I was getting nostalgic uh, over my, the early years of. Um, reading to my kids, which I just, it just hit me that those were like best times, right? Like I just really relished those moments and shout out to Eric Carl, because I think I read Brown Bear Brown Bear like 150 <laughs> times, <laughs> my, my baby. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for this testimony. It was really, really important and powerful. I'm, I'm trying to bring this conversation a little bit full circle with Senator Williams's bill, thinking about um, screens and devices. Do you know if there's any, I think I know the answer to this, but is, do you know if there's any evidence that would point to, you know, voices on a screen being similarly effective as actual people in terms of developing language and literacy skills? I, I would have to go back and, and look into the exact research my recollection, what I've read over the years, and, and I, I may answer it in a slightly different way. The role of the parent, the parent's voice, the, the relationship in person with the parent is absolutely essential. Um, I think if there were a parent working with a child, for example, I was at the Minuski Public Library last week, and they have a lot of parents who they serve in that community who are not fluent in any language. Mm -hmm. So for them to read, would be difficult, not just in English, but in their native tongues. Um, there is research definitely that, and I, I don't have great recall for who said it and when, and I could look that up if you'd like, but there is research that shows that what's most important is that parents read fluently, that there's a fluid reading to the child. So if a parent speaks, um, sp their native language is French, that they read books in French to their child. That is more important than teaching them to read English and maybe reading an imperfect English. You're trying to teach in a fluid, fluent way so that the child understands the rhythm of the language. And if you uh, want to know more about what we would do in story time, we think about a baby rhyme time, for example. And that's for, as soon as the parents feel comfortable taking the kid out of the house, they bring them to these programs. And as you're rhyming, just a basic rhyme like Humpty Dumpty, patting the child, feeling the rhythm of the language, there's a lot of bouncing of the baby, gentle, gentle bouncing, of course, really in influencing how they're hearing the words and how it's a, it's a whole body mm -hmm. activity. Reading isn't something where you sit and push and swipe. There are, mm -hmm. there are products and there are tools that kids like. Sometimes that's the only way to get a book in a language for a child. But I think that that connection with the parent, the connection with their caregiver, their grandparent, that relationship. My boyfriend talks about bringing his kid to the Ilsley Library every week when she was little, that that was something that really meant a lot to them. Developing that practice of reading is a very important thing. And, and the parents actually build a community of support in those, in those settings. Um, so I think that there is a value, and there has also been research about books being kind of mentally stickier, I would say. So um, I'm sure people can learn to read if they just had a tablet. It's probably better than not having it. But for children, for the youngest children, the pre-literacy activities include flipping the pages. They include shaking the board book, <laughs> smelling the board book, ripping the board book. Those are things that actually lead to reading. That's that's some of their print motivation and print readiness. Can I just follow up? So yeah, please more? go ahead. Sorry. So this 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 bill would actually be a precursor to S two hundred four. Oh, okay. And, yeah. and if you want to talk about my bill, if we ever get a chance to see the uh, 
testimony mm -hmm. gets addressed. In. Okay, great. Yeah. I just was, I was going to make one last comment. Which is, sure. No, that's okay. I remember when I was working a librarian, I, every once in a while, I'd get some folks in who would, um, they were so happy to be there and they vocalized that libraries had not been good to them when they were young for whatever reason. Either they had been disciplined for talking or being loud or they had to pay fines or, and so what we really had to kind of reset how they felt about libraries and I'm sure you are doing that, but uh, it was, I hadn't really thought about it until yeah. um, people told me that that was how they were feeling. Yeah, and I think that is something that libraries are in Vermont are doing great work to overcome. That's one of the reasons um, so many libraries have gone fine free. I did a lot of work when I was in San Francisco to help the library to really study fines and how they impact library users in that community. And the studies that we did um, over uh, multiple years showed that the communities of color were most impacted, the poorer communities were most impacted. The tense that fine doesn't mean anything to a person who has resources. Mm -hmm. um, but that damage that's caused can be quite, quite extensive. And, and really when we look at equity and access and look at the working group's um, findings on those topics, it's really important that Vermonters who are newcomers feel welcomed in a library. Our department has a kind of a newcomer collection, which in some ways is kind of geared toward the people accepting the newcomers, but we also are looking at building out our language collections and finding ways to support people with those resources because a lot of people coming to the US don't have the tradition of a public library like we have here. Um, so when you go to other countries, some have strong public libraries and some it's a completely foreign notion. They just never heard of that. And so really explaining to people what we do, um, the department used some of our ARPA funding to just make a fact sheet about libraries and explain this is what you can do at a library and translated it into I think 16 languages and talking with folks in Winooski and learning well, people can't read it. They may speak a language, but they may not be able to read it. So now I'm looking at could we do videos? and have native speakers share the message so that people can get that information. We have some new Vermonters whose language it doesn't exist in written form. Right. Yeah, so really working to, to break down those barriers and to help make sure that people feel welcomed and that there are materials for them and that we have, uh, that we have an ability to serve them and thinking about how will those little kids become great readers. Uh, so, you know, if you've got bilingual parents, like my niece and nephew have bilingual parents. And so my niece is being read to in Chinese and then she's being read to in English and, you know, everybody does their part and it's it's going to all help with her literacy in, in the long run. And I think that that's a really important thing to, to remember that what's important is learning that skill, practicing with your ears, practicing that breaking down of language, that rhythm of talking, um, and really thinking it's fun. I mean, that's part of what happens is that if you've never sat in the seat and listened and you don't enjoy the story, mm -hmm. good luck in kindergarten. <laughs> you will have a hard time. So getting kids ready to learn is one of the things that the public library can help them. So that's really where I see the importance of having the state librarian or perhaps the youth services consultant or someone else in the, in the department if they have stronger skills in that area. Uh, I personally would love to serve myself on, on the council and um, set us off on a path, really working together so that it's a nice handoff and so that the parents feel supported as they become their children's first teachers. And that's really what they are. And if they don't know how to do that, we want to give them those, want to help them get those skills by up-leveling what our practitioners feel of all of the librarians know and, and can share about literacy. One final question I have is you mentioned if you have two parents uh, arriving in the United States, they don't speak English. Did you say that it's helpful for them to, to read and speak in their native tongue that in that way to support their child's understanding of English? Yeah, and if it you're more, they feel the enthusiasm. It's the, the it will eventually help the child learn to be literate in in whichever language. Right, right. Um, and if they don't have access to books, then, um, and if a family were 
you know, if there were a family that spoke the language and their local library didn't have books, we would do interlibrary loan to get them books to try to help them. Um, but say they didn't read, singing songs in their native tongue, conversing, describing their day, going about what they're doing, and knowing that that is something that is important to do. Um, I used More to important than reading it. Like if I were to read French, it's broken. Yeah, the, the idea is that you want that fluidity. You want to learn the pattern of the language um, and you want to have that kind of oral, with an AU, um, an oral um, sense of the language and memory and, and the pattern and the repetition. And with picture books also, you know, the, the picture book format doesn't end once you get to kindergarten. It's, we in libraries have picture books that go all the way up into the adult realm. The language in a well-written picture book, when you look at something like the award-winning Caldecott books, the, there's often interplay between the text and the images. There is, um, so sometimes the images and the text don't match. That's a point of conversation. You want to extend the book, not just read the book, right? Ask questions about the book, thinking about the book when you're walking around later on. Um, so thinking about things like our story walks that we lend out from the library, uh, where people have books out on sticks out in the community. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about language all the time and really focusing on that and focusing on that the, the spoken language is important, the sung language, and just getting the rhythm of the language is really important. But what the librarian can do, even in the absence of books in a language, is to show how important that is. So when I would do a story time, it wouldn't just be here as books. Mm -hmm. You start with singing, you do some movement, you pivot if the kids aren't still interested. You're always kind of tweaking and finessing it to keep the kids interested in the program and to really get them excited and enthusiastic about learning together. Um, and, and sometimes if there were, I remember I used to do a story time, there were a lot of nannies who were Brazilian as well Portuguese. I didn't speak Portuguese, but they did. So right. they would lead they would lead some songs right. for the community. Um, really pulling on the expertise in the community and working with people. And I think right. that's something that we'll be doing more training on these topics uh, for the library community. But that's the type of thing that we want to, to help Vermont's libraries to do and really thinking about expanding story time offerings for different age groups so that they're you know, it's great to have any story time, but we can do story times for finding little, you know, groups of kids in developmental cohorts, and that can really be helpful too because they have different needs. Any final questions from this gentleman? Yeah. So terrific. Tomorrow, I just want to let you know we are going to mark up the public library bill. So if you and what we're going to do is we're going to have Tucker Anderson. I haven't gotten back with you yet, but okay. basically take us through your recommendations okay. so say, hey, that sounds good. So we'll start that process tomorrow if you want to change your I'm planning to do it. So thank Terrific. you for letting me know. Thanks. Great. I'm excited for that. Yeah, thank you. We're excited to have you as a partner in all this. Thanks. St. James. Yeah, as I recall, we have some outstanding questions that uh, Ms. St. James flagged for us on Friday, F three hundred three, that he may have brought to the agency on our behalf. That is what we are looking at now. And it, are we looking at draft two point one? Yes, thank you. So draft two point one in our files. Uh, and so the floor is yours. And we also have um, a first year here for any backup. So please. Thank you, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. Um, we're working with draft 2.1 of your committee amendment to S303. Um, Ted and I have had a chance to confer on some of the issues that I brought up, but it was after I had done all of this lovely highlighting and, <laughs> and gotten a draft of more yet. So um, there might be some settled areas on here that look unsettled, um, but I'm gonna walk you through what's, what's highlighted. It represents both the changes since draft 1.1, um, as well as some of the decision points that we talked about right. last week. And I have also marked up um, adding the ex officio number of the state librarian. So, All right. Thank you so much. The next draft you see will contain that. Um, 
So the first thing we're going to look at is section two. Remember, this is the um, requirement that I'm just going to use a, a general term here, and then we'll delve into which term you all want to use, that teachers complete the mandatory literacy models, okay? Great. And last time I came to you, I brought draft 1.1 1 .1 of your committee amendment was bringing you edits based on recommendations from AOE. And one of the terms they recommended using was this term professionally licensed. And that term confused me because I didn't find that specific term in Title 16 and I had reached out to the agency we've since conferred. Um, but in between Friday and talking to um, the agency, I located the definition for professionally licensed in the, the Professional Standards Board's rules for the licensing of teachers. And so whether you choose to keep it or not, I think it's a good piece of, for discussion for today. So what you have on page one, starting on line 18, the highlighted subsection A, I, we got, um, actually I'm thinking of the other bill where we got rid of definitions, but I added the definition of this term taken from the Professional Standards Board's rules. So lots of policy choices here, right? Professionally licensed, according to that definition, does not include provisional emergency teaching intern or apprenticeship licenses. Now you don't have to go with this definition, right? I would just encourage you that regardless of, of who you require to complete these literacy modules, we don't have dueling terms with two different definitions to confuse folks. So uh, if you if you if you like the definition of professionally licensed from the standards board, then I think there's nothing wrong with using that term here. If you want to modify this definition in any way, then I think we have to talk about whether or not professionally licensed is the correct term to use because it might cause some confusion with the definition that appears in the standards board rules. I think part of our decision would be based on how long somebody can have a provisional and emergency license. You can have a provisional license for 20 years, well, you've got a problem, but if it's provisional license maps out after a certain period of time you transition in, and I feel like we capture those folks. Do you have any? Idea? I don't. Okay. Mr. Fisher. For the, record, for the record, Ted Fisher, Vermont Agency of Education. Um, I'm the agency's director of communications and legislative affairs. And at two, my good friend and colleague, Andrew Prouten, who you have met virtually, will be here in person. He is the assistant director of education quality and head of licensing for us. He's a great person to answer that question, but I do just want to agree with Beth that um, the, the, the process of th this is restricted to educators who are fully licensed. And as part to just add a little color to the decision point, the point of the, the emergency license is that they be get working towards that fully licensed process. I'm looking in the green book, but Andrew can definitely mention it when he gets here. I'm sorry, he's just scheduled for two instead of 130. <laughs> Okay, so you just told us that Andrew's kind of that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah, we've got anything else. Okay. My only other question would be how many provisionals are out there? Because my understanding is there are a lot right now. So that would be another question we could ask. Okay, so we'll wait when Andrew arrives to we'll ask those questions. Thank okay. you. So if we move on to page two, all of the green are decision points. So this is not new. This is the language we looked at last week, but Professional license is the issue we just talked about. So that term, it sounds like we're waiting on another witness to find out if we're going to use that term. The next decision point would be Vermont school. I brought up the fact that this could be an ambiguous term, depending on, on what your intent here is. Is it to include educators? And I, you know, the way that the rest of the statute reads, it would suggest that this term Vermont school includes approved independent schools and public schools. The rest of the statute. So if you look at subsection D, yeah. it talks about public and approved independent schools that employ professionally licensed educators have to maintain a file on completion of the, the literacy module. So that's already in statute. 
No, this is this is brand new. Oh, okay. all of this language is brand new. Got it. When you said if you reference statute, what do you mean? This statute. Oh, so this right. bill. This the, bill. the language we're looking at right, right. is adding to your green book. Got it. Got it. And so I think I would just suggest that if you do want to require all licensed, and we'll figure out what that means, educators. Mm -hmm. um, I should have, my highlighting is just, it's a good thing it's not a requirement to pass the bar. Um, uh, if you do want to require all licensed educators in both public and approved independent schools to complete these modules, then I think you should spell that out here. And if you don't, then you should pick which one and modify the rest of the statute accordingly. Yeah, and I want to hear from the AOE on it uh, as well. Okay and maybe take some more testimony. I don't know what the committee, I know where Senator Gulick is on this, but I don't know where everyone else is. So maybe we'll take a little okay. bit more testimony. And then the last decision point is just that term educator. Educator as defined in the chapter that we are working with includes teachers and administrators. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it's the term teacher would not include the administrators. Right. So that again, decision point for you all. So correct me if I'm wrong, if probably wrong, are you going to ask AOE what they meant? Probably um, wrong. Uh, yes, but I, I think you should hear from them. Okay. Did they ever get back to you? Yeah, yeah. Can you give us a hint what they said? Um, I'm not actually sure that I know. I just know that you have a position. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I apologize. Which question? I'm trying to see where my colleague is. I apologize. Which, which so we're wondering if Vermont educators, are you looking, as you were the main drafters of this bill, to mm -hmm. pull in administrators as well or just teachers? So um, for the record, Ted Fisher, again, we our general feeling on this is that um, the metaphor I used earlier, which uh, may be imprecise, I apologize, is if you're going to lead the troops, then you probably should have the same standard. So we're not concerned about the idea of having principals meet that requirement in terms of alignment to the definition in Chapter 51. Where we get into the sticky wicket is this professionally licensed definition. Um, and that's something, like I said, my, coll my colleague, um, Andrew, can speak to. So you're proposing that principals, superintendents, yes. others in the administration would also do this roughly was it 46, 64 hours of training. Yes. Okay. Senator, you have a No, it was, oh. I think you sort of asked the question that I was going to ask, which is uh, administrators can encompass a lot of folks. So you, you want the, right. the okay. not all administrate to, to be, to, and, and understanding that it is still a pretty all encompassing group. Um, not all um not all administrators require a license, but the ones who do are considered edu to be educators. Right. And so our feeling is that broad brush strokes, again with that provisional question notwithstanding broad brush strokes, if you're a licensed Vermont educator, you should have this understanding. Educators, uh principal and, and this is where I'm like we're getting to the limit of my expertise, so I'll mention this to Andrew, and if he wants to say more, um, and if you permit that. Um, but uh, ed Vermont educators who are administrators also have um, professional learning requirements, just as all other is part of, and have to maintain their license, um, just as 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 a, um, a classroom teacher would have to. So, so we we see that as appropriate. Senator. Thank you. I think um, two questions. So sorry if Gilbert's talked about this, but on line five, page two, when we're talking about newly licensed Vermont educators, should we include the word professionally licensed? That's why that's highlighted there. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. So, and then the other question, I think, well, I guess more of a comment. Um, I, I do want to hear more as to why you know, principals, uh, for example, should go through this uh, literacy instruction training. Uh, you know, at least you know from the way I see their role, it's really more logistical and you know, make sure the you know lights are on and everything's still running. So I don't know that having a having them go through a forty plus hour program to learn about evidence based 
literacy instruction is entirely pertinent to their daily role. So, and I know they have a lot on their shoulders. I mean, everybody working in these schools has a lot on their shoulders. I don't know if adding this to their plate uh, necessarily makes sense, but happy to hear more about it. Yeah, I'd like to hear more as well. We'll have the BPA and those folks in to, to weigh in on this probably tomorrow or the day after. And I mean, I can see both sides of it. Yeah, the, the person at the helm is setting the culture and this it's sort of the academic feel for everything could be great, but 46 additional hours at the top of everything else that they're doing seems like a lot, unless they're teaching a class or having this, working with students or something. Yeah. So I agree with you. Uh, but it would also be helpful to understand what other professional development requirements each of these educators is bumping into on an annual basis. So we're not, to your point, to everyone's point, adding more burden on top of burden that they may not be able to handle. Just being able to understand that development, professional development uh, landscape would be very helpful. Yeah, I think that's a good idea um, because there might be, and I think Senator Kulik may have raised this last week, if we hear from the standards board, is there something that we might take off? If, because this is really important, but maybe there's some give and take a little bit. Yeah. Yes, Ted. Just one hypothetical which might help in thinking through this, which is that the, the majority of educators are licensed for five years. 90% sure that that's the right number, but, but the license lasts for a period of years. And for example, being a principal is an endorsement that, um, that you have on top of your educator license. Mm -hmm. And so it's very possible that let's say I have a French, uh, a French teacher, you know, language endorsement. And I also have a, um, principal endorsement. It's very possible that I might be employed in 2024 you know, for this school year as a principal, and I might take decide to take another job as a French educator the following year. So you do run into these kind of things when you try to parse out the um, endorsement areas um, you know, and split administrators off from the, the base of their license, you do kind of run into these sort of strange hypotheticals where you might have someone who go, who meets the requirements in year one because you say we're exempting everyone with an administrator endorsement who's working as an administrator. You're also weigh, weighing in on, and I am not an attorney and I would defer to ledge counsel or even maybe go and ask AOE legal. You're, and, and perhaps Andrew can speak to this because he deals with licensing more, more often. The question of endorsements is something that is established in, in the standards board rule. And you might be, if you try to unpack that, you might be sort of getting into their area. And I know that you, of course, can preempt them, but it might just, if you make that decision to go that way, you, it, it may, I'm not sure what an unintended consequences it could have. We don't have an administrator license that's separate from an educator license right now. It's done through endorsements. Senator Kulik, when you were reviewed as a teacher, did the principal come down usually? I'm just thinking, would the principal need some of this in order to like review a class and say, gosh, this is really on track or way things are off the rails? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, you typically are um, assessed and observed by an administrator, so that okay. is a good point. And would you mind if I No, that? please go. Um, okay. I also was going to say that we should. One thing that we need to think about is that a lot of our teachers, and I don't have the data, but it would be interesting to get the data. A lot of our teachers become administrators, so they <laughs> will have training. Yeah. And so, excuse me, do we want a population of administrators where like 50% have the training and 50 don't, or whatever the number is? It might be better just to mandate it since that's what, I don't know, something for us to think about. Yeah. Uh, just curious question. Is it intended that this is a one time training? Because to, to uh, 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 Bailey's point that this is a five year cycle. She's, yeah, so this would be for the agency of education that uh, they drafted it, even though we, please go ahead. This is a one-time training? Um, what? For the record, Ted Fisher, Vermont Agency of Education, um, the, the idea is to have them go through the training um, and then newly licensed educators. I get that. Yeah. 
Do they have to renew every? You said every five years. Currently, as we've proposed it, it's not. It's not. Re right. It's not renewed. It would, you would produce. You would do it once, and then we would check at your next renewal. Also, this is my colleague Andrew Proughton. Hello. <laughs> Hello. See you on the screen. Okay, St. James, before we move to Andrew and other things, I think there's some more I would have liked. Yes, but I want to, before we move on from this, yeah. I just um, ask Morgan to post a link to the definition section for this chapter that we are working in in Title 16 and print out the definitions for you all. Oh, great. So that you can have that for this um, discussion um, because... So let me just read the term administrator and I think you, okay. the definition and I think you will see where I'm going with this. So we are, this bill proposes to put a new statute in a chapter with a definition section. So the definition, unless you carve out other language would automatically apply to this section, correct? So the term administrator means an individual licensed under this chapter, the majority of whose employ, uh, of whose employee time in a public school, school district, or supervisory union is assigned to developing and managing school curriculum, evaluating and disciplining personnel, or supervising and managing a public school system or public school program. So the terms in this section are around the role the individual is playing at a point in time. So if you want to apply this requirement, not just to the role that an individual is serving at a specific time, but to the endorsements that they hold or the specific license, licensure provisions that they hold, we may need to, to add some language to this um, to make it clear. So for example, to use the example that Ted just gave, which I, I think was really helpful in highlighting this, if you, for the sake of argument, want this requirement to apply to both teachers, right. the folks in the classroom doing the teaching, and any, for the, again, for the sake of argument, anyone who could be considered an administrator, mm -hmm. in Ted's example, the vice principal or the principal may also hold an endorsement that would allow them to be a French teacher, okay? But if we're just looking at a point in time, that person would meet the definition of administrator. If you just carve out, um, if you uh, if you just, let's say you don't use the term educator, let's say you use the term teacher and principals because you don't want everyone who might meet the definition of educator to have to take these learning modules, then you may run into a situation where someone who is not specifically called out in this section would not have to take the learning module because they don't fit into this definition, but they hold an endorsement that would allow them to fit into another definition. Mm -hmm. And so they could be in that next year a teacher instead of an administrator, right. but they haven't been required to take the module yet. And so then that requirement may kick in at a different time, depending on how folks are using their endorsements. If they're going back into the classroom, that's going to kick something off. But ten, um, eventually, depending if, on if how we, we structure this, right? right? So. If you want, if you if, if you want everyone who fits in that definition of educator, so educator means any teacher or administrator, mm -hmm. and then administrator means everyone I just talked about. You could carve off just principals, but you're you know you're leaving some other folks behind. Mm -hmm. um, the term uh, educator includes teacher or administrator, so that's going to include pretty much everyone who's licensed. Most folks who are licensed by the standards board. But the definitions in, in Title 16 and Chapter 51, so we're not working with the State Board's rules, right. we're working with Chapter 51, yeah. are to a moment in time. If you want to tie this requirement to the endorsement that someone holds, mm -hmm. I'm just suggesting we may need to be specific about that, not just using the definitions in this chapter. I think you all need to just figure out the broad category yeah. of folks, and, and then I'll craft yeah. the language yeah. for you. That's helpful. That's a 
Um, and then the only other um, addition here is on page three, section four, mm -hmm. starting on line six. So this is a requirement that AOE submit recommendations to the standards board on how to strengthen educator preparation programs. They also have to simultaneously communicate those recommendations to the educator programs themselves. And then we added a requirement that they communicate those recommendations to you all as well. And that's it. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you. So um, it's not a question for Beth, but just something to kind of ponder. I was thinking about this bill this weekend. And I was thinking that you know, this is all about you know results oriented programs, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if it's appropriate somewhere in this bill to, it's, it, to build in a review of its success. You get four or five years down the road, you know, what are the metrics showing? It's not having the desired effect. Groups got to come back together and reevaluate the course for the next four or five years. So this, because no, not necessarily a sunset, but a review. Not a sunset, because I don't want to just like go to a cliff and die. It's got to got to get get to a point, a milestone in time. Enough time, people, whoever you know agrees. How much is enough time? And if you really want a results-oriented program, it's got to be based on metrics, and it's got to be it's got to have a milestone where it it pivots or stays on track. Without that, it's just another. It, it could has the potential to become uh, the first page, line 14, another outdated practice. And you can't can't legislate outdated practices. But I think it's a really good point. Would you mean to say something? I am. Beautiful. Um, there is already some of this built into current law. Okay, good. So the powers and duties of the standards board includes a requirement that now this isn't exactly on law. point, Senator Meeks. It's, um, it's, it's, it's not in the bill, it's in current law. So it's in Title 16 in Chapter 51, the Professional Educators Title uh, Chapter. It's Section 1694, which is the powers and duties of the Standards Board. It requires the Standards Board not less than every five years to review its continuing education and other continuing competency requirements for professional educators. And then it has certain things that they need to, um, uh, to put in writing when they do that review. So that's for continuing education or continuing competency requirements. And then, um, let's see, for educator preparation programs, um, you do that for every building, right? Yeah. Especially if you're introducing a new program. I would I would encourage you to hear I would encourage you to hear directly from the subject matter experts on the field and whether or not that's actually happening. It does appear that this this is the, the purpose of the results oriented program approval um, process. Um, and so I would encourage you to hear directly from the field on what's actually happening. Well that's encouraging because I I hope that, that process would lead to this kind of review, but you know, to raise the flag that this is the results of da 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 a legislative review, and we need to address literacy because of following reasons, then move forward. Sorry, Shane. Yeah, thanks. I was just going to say to that point, I, I can kind of see two aspects of it, or I guess two sides of it. You know, I think that looking at literacy scores, you know, yeah, I think that's one way to see, you know, about the effectiveness. But, you know, if, and, you know, if literacy scores are going up, that's obviously a good thing, but there could also be other factors that are causing the scores to go up. So I think, so I, are, are you getting at, look, see if this particular program is effective down the road? That's, yeah. yeah. Senator Williams, the second. Uh, yeah. So if this is already a statute and they're doing it, obviously, that won't help No, they're not. They're just doing, the, they're doing the five year review Standards board is doing a five year review. Standards board, yeah. Continuing uh, competency requirement. Yeah. Just, yeah. Same for field. clarity, can I get, I can, I'm not understanding what provision of this bill are you talking about? Are you specifically? Overall. overall. But I mean, there, but for example, there's a part of this bill that talks about the, um, the literacy council. So are you, 
mostly pointing at the modules? Is that what you're? No, I'm pointing at getting results, how establishing metrics, getting results, and reacting to those results. If you really want evidence based and and uh, data driven, da da da, you got to build it in. Yeah. I know, I understand that. I'm just, I think this bill has a lot of disparate provisions and it'll have even more once we add the imagination library. Yeah, yeah I get that. So, it's, it's a multi section. It's a, so, yeah, it's, it's a combination, I think, with, um, correct me if I'm wrong, between 204 and this, and the section of 303 where the modules become required. I would think that in five years, I, I speak for myself, I would love to see those reading scores up, and I think we will, recognizing that there are a lot of other things that could happen that could raise them or lower them. But that does seem like we can talk to Andrew to see, is it, should we, what should we be seeing in five years? Should, it, should we really start to see? Keeping the imagination library out of it, which I don't think is going, it's big, but I think what we're talking about is the S204, and this report. Okay, I want to clear yeah, what yeah. parts you were talking about. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I think that it's important that the administrator, the principal, whatever, should at least know what, you know, if it takes, a, takes instruction. So I think it's important that the teachers know that he knows. I'm inclined, but yeah, we'll hear from Andrew. Uh, if, 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 if principals are observing, what teachers are doing and they're going in, it does seem to make sense. But I also recognize that principals and everybody have a lot on their plates. If we pull something off for their, I don't, Andrew can help us with this in terms of their keeping up with their certification, et cetera, so that they can focus on this. Take five minutes. Andrew, please come on up while we take five minutes. Get yourself comfortable. We've got a lot of questions. Welcome back to Senate Education. So, Miss, uh, Andrew, your last name is Prouten? Yep, Mr. Prouten. It's great to have you with us. Uh, you probably have heard some of our questions, but let me, let's go to the bill. Again, we are looking at the revised copy. This is 2.1 of 303. And we're trying to understand a couple of things. The agency, had, they drafted this a couple of times, um, and there's a little confusion. We got one draft, then they came back with changes. We got another draft. And now we're, we're, we're trying to sort of um, settle some questions that are still outstanding. And the first one, and others please feel to jump in, has to do with the first page. And if you look under mandatory completion of literacy, literacy models, we are talking about, we are trying to decide whether or not professionally licensed should be used around people that should be receive this, and whether it should include people who are provisionally licensed, emergency licensed, teaching interns, apprentice licenses, those kinds of folks. So let's start there. And tell yeah. us uh, your thoughts. Great. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, in, for the record, Andrew Brown, Assistant Director of Education Quality, primarily licensing preparation. Um, so yeah, a couple different pieces within that. Um, to start with that, I, that idea of the provisional license, um, there's definitely pros and cons. I mean, I'm I, I kind of going back and forth on this. And actually, this might be helpful, and I apologize yeah, for interrupting. Sure. How long can a provisional license last? Yep. Okay. Um, so, in a, a provisional license, when first issued, it's two years, and if they're extenuating circumstances, we may, um, at the request of a superintendent, issue a, a, a an, an additional one year. So okay. it can be a total of three. So you could have a teacher teaching literacy for three years and not have to go through this. And that see, I think the community would be concerned with that. Right. Okay. So I think on that piece, there there's that appearance of, you know, what's what's fair, right? We're asking the professionally licensed teachers, but not this group. Um the where I was thinking just on that idea of that implementation, I'm working a lot, especially with uh, special education <laughs> provisional license holders right now. We've been doing a lot of work to, to try to, to recruit people into the field to support them. So um, we have a whole new cohort, 88, I believe, uh, under that, as, as well as some, some additional. 
folks. Um, so the requirements that they, they're working on right now, they have to take and pass the Praxis too for special education, which is not usually required, but for this cohort, we, we really want to make sure. They have to go through separate modules um, that we use through Vanderbilt University, which, which is quite a lot of work. Um, that's all within their first 30 days of teaching. Provisional license. Yeah, okay, that provisional license. Uh, they then will also need to start going through an actual licensure program. We're finding uh, the majority of, of this cohort are going through Vermont Higher Ed Collaborative, so that's 21 credits. Um, <laughs> and, and that's a lot for two years, so they're starting to extend it to that third year. Um, Who's paying for that, Jim? It depends. Um, I think a lot of, most recently, the, the tuition reimbursement um, process, that new forgivable loan yeah. program, um, but then districts are are putting money in. There's the most in most districts, someone on a provisional license would qualify for PD funds. Um, and then depending on sort of that local context and, and the contract, there may be some additional funds. I think some districts use some of the, the COVID, the federal COVID funding as well. Um, so when I think about about those folks on provisional licenses, right, they're doing an entire preparation program that and sometimes, you know, four years being, being acted into you too, as well as being first first year teachers. Um, so that was sort of my thinking when, when posing that question of, of do we really want to include the provisional licenses in there? Because part of our strategy is really looking at them as, as retainment. Uh, we're seeing a, a pattern where folks are unable to complete all of the requirements. And so then after two years, um, sometimes three, but, but usually just two years. Um, they're leaving and the school's re recruiting someone totally new and starting over. And we know that that definitely has some negative impacts on, on students. So, so we're really, really doing a lot to try to retain them, get them in. And, and I think with the language of the bill, once they are professionally licensed, they would still have to do the modules within those first two years. Seems to me, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that again, if we're gonna put somebody in elementary school, for any time, 46 hours seems like a logical thing to do to make sure the children are learning to read and write properly. Exactly. Whether provisional, emergency, whatever. Right, so I mean, what I was speaking about, that's 88 people. We have yeah. almost 900 provisional and emergency licenses this school year. Okay. Just issued, that's not including folks on the second, second or So are you agreeing that we should move in this direction with the provisional requiring this 46 hours for teachers. Okay. Yeah, I think in that that whole context, especially for thinking about elementary ed teachers and stuff, that, that could make sense. And and this could get just moving ahead a little bit into some of that nuance when we start thinking about that implement, implementation and different endorsements mm -hmm. where it would and would not be appropriate as well. Thank you. It's nice having you here. I feel like we should have had you here earlier. Um, so yeah, this is great. But uh wanted to say that I think I my personal opinion is I feel like we should move pretty slowly on this. It seems like it's important and it's gonna have big impacts on not just our kids and their reading, but on the you know, on teachers. So I just want to make sure we get this right. I also was gonna say that um well, what was I gonna say? Something about teachers and provisional emergency. Yep. Wow. Okay, that just is gone. That's embarrassing. And I'll come back and okay. then I'll chime back in again. So just a kind of a curiosity question. Do you do you do you or or Ted see any uh, complications with the language in here? I'm inadvertently rolling in unanticipated educators, uh, such as driver's training, CDL schools, I don't know, you name it. I mean, there's all kinds of educational universities, as an example. You know, how do we, is there, is the language clear enough that what we're really talking about is, uh, you know, K to 12 type uh, institutions as opposed to the full universe of people who provide training and education in the state? Yeah, I think that's getting into that section three. Yeah. Um... For the record, again, Ted Fisher from the Agency of Education. Uh, there are some there are some limits. We're not talking about university professors who really just we, need to yeah, know, so talking, I know what your intent is. Right. Um, that's clear. But is the language sufficient 
to kind of put boundaries around, okay, Bennington College, yeah. 46 hours, see you, you know, right. see you when you're done. I, I think that I could be wrong, but that's what we talked about, professionally licensed. Sir. I think that would limit the post-secondary education folks. Mm -hmm. But I, I think I think we're struggling. We have, we at AOE are struggling as as is as is the committee with the question of the some of the breadth of this. And you, you heard me advocate for administrators being included here, but the way you have it currently drafted in um, sorry in two point one, um, it, it, it it's because I'm very just hearing from my colleague about the cohort for special education students understanding or special education teachers understand that's an area of high need. It's, it's an area where they have lots of requirements that they need to learn. They still should know literacy, but we're also concerned about recruitment and retention and the burden of things we're putting on them. And that's an area of high interest for us statewide. So I think we're grappling with that same end, um, but I'm also very receptive to to um, Senator Gulick's point about wanting to move slowly, which is I think where why we kind of fall down on the um, professionally licensed um, uh, definition because it allows for some remembering. Yes, there is a potential that it could take three them three years to to go through the full process. They're still going to be a licensed educator and they're still going to be subject to this. There's, There's no reason why they couldn't do it. Hours and I'm wondering also if you would help me with this. It seems to me that. We are running a risk of not teaching kids the right way if you have a provisional license for two, even two years. That, so exactly that, that's, the, that's exactly the kind of argument we're struggling with, and that's why our okay. original proposed yeah. version has so educators right. um, as the definition. I remember what I was going to say. This is good. This is good. Okay. Um, I was going to mention the concept of coaches because I know. There are schools that have reading coaches and have all kinds of various coaches who are there for professional development. So I am thinking again and in, in like thinking of moving slowly. If you do have a teacher who or a provisional licensed teacher who's in a school who might not have the time or the wherewithal or it's, you know really overwhelmed in those early years might not be able to complete the modules you know it's and i don't know what the coaching landscape looks like exactly but it would be interesting to know if they had supports within the school to help help them with the reading and with making sure that their reading instruction practices were to ask based on science for you mr chair to ask just a clarifying question do you mean potentially adding another section or another subsection that would require that individuals who are going through that process be working, you know, be working in concert or in collaboration with someone who is an, I don't know the right term, coach, coach or, you know, highly skilled literacy or someone who's highly skilled in reading. What do you, yeah. what do you think about that? Uh, well, I, I yeah, gonna say, I'm not going to answer that question because I don't know enough yet, but it's something to think about. Yeah. And if I may, I, I just, Sometimes I make this analogy, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but would we ever say to a nurse, I don't need to run this bed while well, with your provisional, even though you may see patients. I mean, hmm. damage to me, we have a huge literacy issue in this state. And a provisional teacher can be in the classroom for three years teaching reading and writing at third grade. I just... It doesn't work for me, but maybe I'm I'm missing something. Please. Yeah, you know, I, I certainly agree. And that's that's kind of what I keep going back and forth on. Um, especially thinking about elementary education. Uh, I think it's like 124 provisionals in that that we've issued this year um, for elementary ed, uh, which is also now we're we're still working through some of the data that looks like it may may now be a a, a shortage area. For our state, as well as other states, which is is new context for our country. Um, so, in that, absolutely, I think that that in that cohort, something like this would be a really valuable resource for them. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, in that context, I would certainly agree. There are also situations 
one thing that we've been seeing is that a lot of the people who are working on provisionals, and I, I don't have like a good percentage or data point, but but anecdotally at least, it's a lot of individuals that I've been supporting who have gone through a preparation program and, and just didn't pass the testing, or they didn't, they were unable to do their student teaching because you know illness in the family or something like that, and they've been working in schools for the past ten years, and now since they've never really been considered for a licensed teaching position. Um, with the shortages, they're being considered, they're getting put on provisional licenses, and, and they're doing very good work and really showing that, that commitment working in our schools and in a licensed position. So um, there are lots of really, really good, um, you know, not professionally licensed, but still qualified individuals who are working in those positions. Maybe yeah, just please. So again, I'm still kind of wrapped around the whole professional licensing mm -hmm. uh, part of the definition. And I was just thinking that um, you know, professional licensing for educators in fields outside of AOE's purview, that's kind of, you know, that's that's kind of the caution then. But I thought of a couple more just sitting here in like, you know, pilot pilot training, scuba as an example, they're professionally licensed. I'm just wondering if, if we need to. You know, again, put boundaries around this so that you protect. And I, I, I agree, I understand and agree with the premise of the bill. I just don't want to like start scraping in people who unintended, um, uh, you know, affect them on unintention. So, my St. James, let me ask you: Would somebody who is, uh, as Senator Weeks points out, it's important that we're not looking to pull in. People who are school instructors, people, you know, you know, that group of people, if you will, just as an example, could they with this language be pulled in? No. Okay. Occupational licensing spans. Uh, well, no. Occupational licensing is for occupations. Yeah. And then you require, there's licenses required for a myriad of things that we all participate in society. Yeah. When we're looking at trying to figure out what law applies to what group, we're orienting ourselves to where the law is located. So for this example, big picture, Title 16, educational land. And then we go, the next level would be the chapter. And this, I forget the title of the chapter, but chapter 51 is licensing of teachers. And then um, this specific definition in draft 2.1, we're talking about educator licenses specifically. Mm -hmm. So I would say there's multiple layers um, that would exclude everyone that you brought up automatically without having to make an amendment to this. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's fine. I just, I just, he's like, he raised it as a precautionary yeah, thing. We just want to make sure. Yeah, I'm not trying to change anything. So. Yeah. Senator Rekula, please. Adult Ed. Do they, are they licensed educators? No, but there is, we do have a license for director of adult ed in CTE mm -hmm. centers, but the instructors themselves are not licensed. Okay, interesting. Okay, so do the modules, but yeah. Um, could you define the difference between emergency and provisional for us? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, so an emergency license is um, someone has a bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. uh, and the school has not been able to hire an otherwise qualified educator. Uh, provisional license, uh, there's a couple of different dates. If they hold uh, an expired or valid license from Vermont or another state, they would qualify. If they have um, at least 18 credits in the content area, 21 for special ed. Mm -hmm. um, and then, or if they've passed the practice to content test, if there's one for, for that content area. Um, and there's less limitations on the district. Like they could hire someone if, if there is um, yeah, uh, an otherwise strong candidate. And how long does an emergency license last? Just one school year. It's just that one school year. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then teaching interns and apprenticeship licenses. Again, we're trying to see who we really want to pull into this. Yeah, so we wouldn't have that. I think that language it seems to come a little bit from our um, our general definition that encompasses other states yeah. as well. So we don't have any licenses for 
uh, teaching interns. Mm -hmm. um, apprenticeship licenses is specifically talking about CTE centers. So um, that's like a whole another can of worms. It's an interesting thing. So would, is another term for teaching intern uh, teaching a teacher, uh, student teacher, student teacher. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think that would be captured in some of the work mm -hmm. on on ROPA, which which gets into that question earlier around our our, our metrics and our assessment is um, what I would envision is is that our teacher prep programs would either use these modules or adapt their current epic. Like I'm I'm sure. A, a few, like when I went through UVM, I had a, a reading course, even though I was secondary social studies, right? Yeah. So, so there can already be an alignment in there, um, and we could get to a point where they're they're meeting this requirement during their pre-service education. So, committee, I think the question for all of us is, you know, who else do we want to capture in this? Do we want provisional? Do we want emergency? Do we want student teachers uh, to go through this forty-six hour? training get sign off on it i mean my gut at the very least personally but so total you know, provisional seems to me to kind of have them go through it and i also do worry about the emergency if you're teaching second grade for a year that's but i also you know yeah that's you know shame and that's kind of how long again do folks normally have an emergency license uh, it's just one school year so let's go again Yes, I'm sorry. That's no, sure no, no, please. Um, aren't second grade teachers in their endorsement learning how to teach reading and face in science? I mean, isn't that part of their training as, I mean, I- Through, through the preparation programs? Yeah. Yeah, there's, I can't remember exactly. There was, we've done a couple different uh, reviews and, and there's a couple different organizations that do. And generally the way that we like rank on those, I'm, not super thrilled on when they get letter grades, but um, through our standards, there are a lot of the, the you know, phonetics and all those mm -hmm. uh, yeah. those components that are in our standards and are at least addressed, I believe, in all of our preparation programs. Some of them will have it you know, addressed and they kind of move on. Other ones do a really, really good job. So it depends on the individual program. And just to be clear, are these modules going to be mandatory for everyone, regardless of how much literacy training they have? Yeah. Okay. Cool. To clarify, um, we asked in our second, our last round, there would be the possibility that um, so so the the language in section two now says, and I'm quoting from memory, so it's something along the lines of the uh, modules of adopted by the agency or selected by the agency or approved other ones. So we could, in reference to someone who's a highly trained literacy specialist with years of experience, they would have some professional learning in their past that would meet our standard. If you would permit me, Mr. Chair, I think we're leaning into, to your point a moment ago, we're leaning into some concern. And Andrew can please kick me under the tail if I'm saying anything wrong. But the the it's important to note that provisional and emergency licensure are things that get undertaken when we cannot fill a candidate, or, or in certain other cases where you maybe have someone who's an educator from another state who needs to go through the licensing process. But we're, we are hoping that everyone is meeting as soon as possible that high standard. And I just wanted to, um, to sort of acknowledge that fact, as you all know, we are in a, an employment crisis, right. and unfortunately. So we do struggle with that. Um, I think we're all, we, we also struggle with that same concern you had, Mr. Chair, about um, about that, uh, we're trying to figure out how to navigate the moment that we're in, in the hopes that we get to a point where we're getting this as soon as possible. Right, and I think this committee doesn't want to look at five years and say, geez, right. we're in an employment crisis, otherwise our test scores would be better. That, that's, that's a good point. Absolutely. So, okay. So, committee, what, do you, what would you like to do? I think the choices are, you know, what do we want to do around provisional? Now, to your point, I think it's a good one. If somebody does come in in second grade and they have some kind of credential that they can get signed off on, okay, Mike has this, he's good, but if he doesn't have it, then it seems to me that we've got to go through this 46 hour. Yeah, I mean, do we have to decide right now? Did I have some time to think about it? 
Oh, there's somebody turned the clock. What is it, the hourglass? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Well, you can absolutely have time to think about it. I just um, love to start to close the. I'm not trying to put this soft pressure. This is soft pressure. Right, right, right. Uh, Please. Yeah, I, pressure. I, I do think, you know, a provisional license you know, should probably go through this program. Uh, but, you know, with the emergency license, you know, if, if the option is no teacher at all versus yeah. an emergency licensed teacher who may not have the module training, so I'd rather go with the emergency licensed teacher who doesn't have the module rather than nobody at all for that classroom. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. My assumption, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're a provisional, if you're provisionally licensed, the intent is there's a there's a there's a there's a a runway to it that ends, and then you're licensed, and you either fail or or you pass. So I think that doesn't that kind of scoop in that requirement. I mean, it kind of recognizes that provisional is uh, a temporary state and leads to a, a fully licensed educator. Yeah, I think that's what we're we're really working towards right now. Um, like we, we Vermont hasn't historically had the same shortage. Um, issues as, as other states. So um, provisional licenses, we used to do like 300 a year, right? So we're almost triple that. Okay, that's a number though, but it's like year to year, that 300 then becomes 50, then becomes 10, then, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like that same cohort as it moves through time, eventually lead, I would assume leads to fully licenses. Right. Then it falls into the other category that they're, that they're in training, right? Yeah. Or new. Right. I think the issue that we're experiencing right now is that there are so many people on that. We don't have the infrastructure at, at this time to really get them licensed within that time, right? They're only serving a number of seats. So that's what a lot of the work that we've been doing to really support utilizing you know, our peer review program, um, really working with our ed prep programs to develop a lot of flexibility. And they've really stepped up over the past few years with the pandemic. Uh, programs that used to not work with people on provisional licenses have been over the past several years. So, so um, we're still really trying to figure out how to really track the data, but we want to see a higher percentage of people on the provisional license um, get that, you know, that professional license at the end. That's a, that's a good last point, as Andrew mentioned earlier. They either become a, a professionally fully licensed educator, or they, or there's attrition, and they. And they drop out, and the school is back to trying to hire sometimes hiring another provisional emergency license. So, because a provisional license has a window of, uh, you know, it ends at a certain point. It, it can be. It, it it could also just be naturally it's it's not a good fit, and so the person right. case decides not to, or uh, or it could just be they're covering for for a family leave for a few months, right? And then even though they have a two year provisional, they're they only work for five months or whatever. Um, but we are concerned, correct me if I'm wrong, about the, 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 there are lots of requirements on them in terms of moving towards the license. So we're talking about adding another another thing to a pile that could lead to attrition in terms of yeah. making it through the program. Mr. Fannin, what do you think? Provisional licensing for teachers. So that do we have, and this is the 46 hour question. Right. <laughs> I have 46 hours and we say, <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. So I'd answer. Yeah. Uh, for the record, Jeff Fan from on EA. Yeah. I think that uh, one of the things we have to make note of is Senator Weeks sort of was getting at, I, I was thinking, is that there's two types of folks on provisional licenses. Mm -hmm. Those people who don't have a license yes. in any other way. And I've got a board member, for example, right now who's been teaching for more than 20 years, who by virtue of her new assignment in seventh grade, okay. only had a K-6 endorsement had to go through peer review to get, uh, because she's now on a provisional license, she had to go through peer review when Andrew understands it. So uh, she's been you know, at this for 20 plus years. She's a seasoned professional. Yeah. Uh, do you want to scoop up people such as her who have been, by virtue of the shortage, has been asked to teach in an area now that she's not endorsed in? Uh, and so yeah, that's a question for you that you probably need to grapple with this. But, well. correct me if I'm wrong, we, we want all teachers to go through this. Yes. So she, he or she may be scooped up 
no matter what. Correct. I think okay. the way it's written now is right. correct. Right. The other piece is the ROPA, the the the, the programs who are preparing teachers, yeah. be teachers. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, that there used to be, as you noted, a requirement that everybody get uh, some literacy instruction, whether you were teaching, aiming for a, a high school uh, assignment or or first, you know, elementary school. Yeah. Uh, I believe that's been eliminated or not eliminated, but it's it's non requirement in many school professional programs now. And I think that's something that you think you're grappling with here as well. I think that's that's an important decision. That's been going on for some years, and we're maybe seeing the results of that. Yeah. Just to remind you, the reason we started this two years ago is because we had teachers come before us saying they did not know how to teach reading and writing. So that's why we're in continuing this direction. Licensing uh, administrators, Andrew, mm -hmm. what do you think? Yeah, I think that the point was made um, earlier of somebody's evaluating a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I personally do think it would be important for at least the building administrators to participate in this. So it would be right at that way if you are evaluating a teacher who is teaching literacy or do you think all field administrators? Actually, I'm looking at Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure on specific language. It, it, I think this might get in the probably not like this answer, I apologize in advance. Like some of this might be part of that like interpretation and implementation. Once we start engaging in stakeholders, mm -hmm. I'd really like to be able to have some flexibility on those determinations, right? It, what it looks like in one district may look different in another. Um, right. So um and I think again that's kind of getting into that section three piece, but but having that that ability to really Engage with stakeholders, look at each individual endorsement to, to kind of one at a time make those decisions with lots of input in the process. Ben, what do you think of that? Would it help your teachers if principals go through this as sort of a, not only in terms of the evaluation process going into a classroom, but kind of the all hands on deck a little bit, or do you think principals need him? Well, I want to speak first. Jay, the no, I know, I know that. Yeah, I'm thinking, yeah. I, I think what you're asking is, do, do I think it's important that does it enhance from a teacher's perspective that a principal knows uh, something about which they're evaluating uh -huh. me on as a teacher? And I think the answer is yes. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah, please, Senator York. My only other thought is that we be very mindful of the timing. I just, I, the word overburden just came in, uh, and I, I, it's just true. They're, they are overburdened. So if we can somehow roll it out, I know the clock is ticking and, and so on, but like first do no harm, right? Let's let's try not to harm folks. Um, Chicken with kids. Well, then let's put in here, you know, you can't teach the three queuing method, the method or, you know, like we could, we could explicitly call out some ways of teaching, re teaching reading that just simply don't work and actually could cause harm. So if we want to get explicit, we could, but I'm just saying, um, I, I want to be mindful of um, retaining the teachers we have and possibly even welcoming new ones without scaring them away or turning them away. I did just want to signpost that we were mindful of this when we were doing the drafting. So we have some deadlines. I was actually scrolling to the bottom to look for effective dates, but they are they are in actually in the provisions on ROPA and then the provision on licensing. So we have ROPA is we have a July 1 deadline to submit recommendations to the VSBP. And then VSBP has a July 1 deadline of excuse me, we have a July 1 deadline of 25. To submit recommendations to the BSVP. July is July 1. So we're talking about because the way we think now, and we learned a lot of good lessons from some of the language we, or the bills we worked on last year. Y'all will pass this sometime between sometime April, May, it'll it'll go to the governor. By the time it gets through the whole process, we get a July 1. So that gives us a year from time of from effective date of passage approximately, to get those recommendations to the Standards Board. The Standards Board then has a year as part of their rulemaking process, which happens every two years mm -hmm. regular, yeah. regularly. So as part of their upcoming rule, rulemaking process, the 
when Andrew and I were working on the section, we coordinated on that. So it'd be July 1 of 26, they would consider. So that's for ROPA in section four. Section two, um, we have a uh, honor before January 1 of 26. So that would give, let's say again, from time of passage, that would give 18 months um, for, for Vermont educators to do the modules, um, uh, to complete these modules. And then, um, but then we would have, um, we have a honor before January 1 of 2025, all newly licensed Vermont educators employed. So those are for people who are coming into the profession post passage of the bill, right? Uh, so that would be a requirement for us for licensure starting in January 20, January 1st of 2025. So we're really talking about the licensing year that ends January 30th, right? Like that application, correct? Yeah, for, for some folks. So it would be January 30th, 25. So everyone would have 18 months to do this work. Can we make it two years? Yeah. And is that? We could consider there's the ROPA, we aligned with the ROPA for the standards board to uh, planned session of rulemaking that is upcoming. And yeah, correct me if I'm getting that wrong. No, I think, I think that what we have for ROPA makes sense. If you're speaking specifically two years for the, the individual teachers completing the modules. Um, yeah, two years for forty six hours. Yeah, just to just to... right. I know. I'm just thinking. If I'm a parent, I've got a kid. Uh, again, I know no do. We don't want to lose teachers, but I, unless I'm saying, just don't want the kids to have to go through a couple of years where they don't. I don't know what's funny about this interview. What's so this is not. So this is not a binary, right? This is not. If we don't pass these modules today, kids are going to suffer. They're, that's not. I, I don't see that. Now. I don't see that as as reality. There, there are reading reading scores are not what they should be. That does not equate to suffering. I I would disagree. I mean, if you are getting reading third grade and you cannot read and write at the grade level, that's a huge problem. I mean, we had teachers again in here two years ago saying, "I don't know what I'm doing." And again, if I'm a parent, I think that is a huge problem, and it does create great to suffer. It's also a problem to have schools that don't have teachers in them. Like, absolutely. Just, like I said, it's not a binary, it's a landscape, and we have to be really thoughtful about how we roll this out. I agree, and I just say, would say, if I, I think we've got to put kids first all the way through this, and the risk of kids going through two or three years of being, as we're saying, not taught properly, that is, I think that's huge, but maybe I'm, perhaps I'm wrong. Yes, please, just read uh, the so I'm with you. I, I think 18 months, theoretically, is sufficient, but I think we do, do need to hear some testimony about what is the other professional development load on, on the teachers, just to understand. I mean, look, they could say in that 18 months, well, I've got a requirement to do X number of hours per year. I don't have anything else I have to do. Obviously, now I'll do this training. Or the different scenario, holy cow, I've already got 60 hours of professional training requirement for this next 18 months. Uh, and you know, how do I accomplish this? I, I just don't, I don't understand the landscape of the teachers themselves and what their professional development is. Be able to gauge whether 18 months or 24 months or or more is appropriate. I think we need to hear at least one testimony. Ted, no. okay. I, I would just say like I I we we the agency agree with both both uh, all three perspectives that we've heard here, which is that um we were very concerned about implementation timelines and enough time for both us and for the field, but we also are feeling the urgency. And so the timelines, we did a we did a much better job than pre-session when we were coming up with some de deadlines and also a more thoughtful job than we did last year when we asked for some effective dates. So these there is some thought put into these effective dates. I will actually just take the opportunity and although Beth and I had talked about this, so we did need to come back to it. In section three, where we have currently um, a develop and distribute a list of professional learning requirements specific to each licensing endorsement. We as the agency have determined we don't actually need that. Andrew's team is empowered to offer guidance 
about what under section two of this bill as currently contemplated about what would be appropriate modules for each licensing endorsement that would be an alternative to the AOE's module. So we are on track to do that as of September 1st of this year. We could do that right now. I mean, it, it would be linked to the bill, but we don't need, we don't need legislative authority to do that. Um, we would do it as a result of passage on, under section two. So we're able to implement that. I checked that timeline and Andrew, he's comfortable yeah. with it. <laughs> Um, yeah, my to -do and it's on the to-do list. Um, and what I should just say is un unusual to some of our legislative conversations, and this is because we have to remember we did pass a literacy bill a couple of years ago. We have a set of modules that already exist. Educators could go in now pre-passage. We're encouraging them to do so. We're doing work to try to encourage folks to do it. So we do have these resources available. So we do, just to come back full circle, we are cognizant of the need to be careful and provide enough time, but also care cognizant of the urgency. Um, so we, I, I'd like to see get, get the language out, get, it, get that finalized, who's going to be affected by it, and then let the experts decide the timing. Uh-huh. That'd be quite hate to get. Yeah, that's a good question. Other questions before we shift. You guys are staying quick. We're just shifting to S204. So as I see it, we need to decide timing, whether or not we're incorporating administrators, whether or not we're talking about provisional licensing, uh, requiring people who are on provisional licenses or not. And I think those are the big... Oh, the other thing, what we have you on this topic has to do with... Um, whether or not you look on page two, letter line one, on or before January 1, 2026, should that be all professionally licensed Vermont educators? I guess what we're looking, maybe Beth can help me there. There's something I have flagged, it could be line five actually, newly licensed professional, St. James. Um, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. So, um, You've already talked. To, you've already flagged for yourselves the professionally licensed and the educator decision points. Right. That is not settled. You've just talked about right, that. Right. Right. On line five, newly licensed is highlighted because the recommendations that came from the agency use the term professionally in subsection B, but not in subsection C. And so I didn't know if that was a, a intentional. Um, difference or not? Yes. Yeah. You ask that. Can we say that again? So, if you look at um, if you look at line one, yeah, all professionally licensed Vermont educators, right? That was a suggestion from AOE, right? On line five, there the, there was no suggestion to insert that word Got professionally. It. Yeah. But I'm guessing that that is just an oversight, yeah. but it also could have been a policy decision. It looks like it's an oversight. Yeah. Yeah. I always have it confirmed that the intent was educators coming into the profession from the traditional pathways to licensure, but yes, it could apply to both. So newly professionally licensed, just lots of words ending in line here. Right. Um, the, the, Please, yes. The only other decision point that you haven't brought up here, which may not be appropriate for this folks, but if you're gonna move on, I just wanna flag it. It's just, we've got subsection D, which seems to imply that this whole section should apply to licensed educators in public and approved independent schools. And if that is your intent, I would just add some, some language to make that clear. And if it's not your intent, well, you'll want to flush that out. You're talking about whether or not it's their intent. You're right, 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 your right. Bill. <laughs> right. But you guys draft it. So where are you on this? So just the Sorry, term. Just extra. The term school head. Yeah. And then right here is the Vermont Public Head Proof Independent Schools that employ the professional license. So okay, so I think that's the difference is anyone who's required to have a license. So in some schools. It, special educators are required to be licensed. Right. So in that context, yes. Right. Okay. Um, and so it's through license, right. basically, is the way that right. I think. I'm so, and I'm sorry. I just um, I um, I just lost track there for a second. If we did discuss this briefly previously, which was the idea that if it, it is not a requirement 
in some proved independent schools for educators to be licensed. However, you have a, there are licensed educators who work in approved independent schools. And so if you employ a licensed educator, the requirement to keep this follows you. That makes sense. It follows the licensed educator. So just for clarity, if you're not a licensed educator, you don't have to do the modules, period? That is the intent of the section. Well, right? If we have an emergency, we need some licensed professionals. To, to I'm have. talking about the ones in approved independent schools who may have been there for 25 years. We're not going to require them to do the modules. I think, well, I think we still have to determine that ourselves. Right. I would mean, for your position. You right. can, that's a, exactly, you're, abs you're absolutely right, Mr. Chair and, and Senator, that is a policy decision. If you want to, if you want to require all teachers in Vermont. Right. The, the thing is, from the agency's perspective, we regulate the ed licensed educators, regardless of where they serve. But the law requires that public schools employ licensed educators and those same requirements don't apply to all independent schools. So I we, our abilities to track and enforce are different depending on the venue. Right. But if we're talking about harm to children, I think we this is a really important policy decision that we have to make because we don't want to harm some kids and not harm other kids. That doesn't seem to make sense. And that sounds like that's your position. We did it with school meals, right? All right. You know what? That's a no, that's a that is a well, that's a good that is a decision so point for you. Our our position is we're we're sticking to what we know, which is the licensed educators. Great. Miss St. James, uh, this is, you asked us, I believe, to print out a version of the Vermont statutes online. These are just the definitions for the conversation you just had. So, um, to the extent when you mull over the terms to use when we're talking about educator, administrator, these are the definitions that automatically apply to anything going in this chapter. You can make up your own definitions for each individual section, but if you were to use the term educator and not modify it in any way, these are the definitions that would apply. Great. 204. Andrew, you're back up. So um, you, we have 2.1 of 204 in front of us. And I think we have you in just to comment, express confidence where things have landed, whatever you would like on S204. And we have Ted Fisher in as well. Um, with apologies, Mr. Chair, um, the lead uh, witness for this bill is myself. Yep. Okay. Um, because we're moving away from licensing into general literacy. So the, we don't have concerns with the, we have one potential caution um, with one of the provisions of section one um, on page four. Um, we're seeing, uh, we, we like the changes we've seen in terms of some of the concerns we had about clarifying um, the independent schools question I testified. I'm also available to speak as well to some of the questions about implementation um, that you had asked us to come back on. Right. So we're going to have to decide the uh, public and independent school piece. But do you have any other concerns as it relates to this bill at this time? The only thing to flag is, and it's highlighted in green um, on page four, is sub G. Um, so that's the only place where the term local literacy plan, and I'm phoning a friend and my colleague Emily Lesh, who I know spoke to you Friday. So I'm just going to pull up her, what she's told me. Um, the literacy plans, um, we've actually provided the local literacy plan template. Mm -hmm. We get clarifying questions from the field as to whether this is a requirement or not. I just did a quick search of the bill, and local literacy plan, plan is only listed here. Um, we're not sure if that means you're requiring it. Usually when you require things, you're a little bit more explicit about doing so. And Beth 
Um, uh, the so we're that was a question for ours. We don't necessarily recommend requiring a local literacy plan um, at this time. Well, the um, this is for G and it's highlighted in green. It looks like your printed version. The green is very yeah. dark. Apologies. Um, yeah, and I think the committee also was a little confused. This is your original language. You know that, right? Or, um, no, no, it's not. Is it recommended from Ms. Carolus or is it? Okay, so this is AOE's language that you're not supporting. I am sorry. I was not aware it had been provided by a colleague. Um, so it says, each local school district and improved independent school shall engage local stakeholders through the needs assessment and asset mapping process when developing a local literacy plan to improve reading proficiency. And frankly, I think we just need to understand what that would be. Do we know Ms. St. James? Please go ahead. That's St. James Office of Legislative Council. So this is highlighted in green because of the decision point. Yeah. No change has been made since draft 1.1. Because we kind of skipped over the topic, we just flagged it as a decision point on how, on whether or not you want any to require any local engagement. Okay. Um, but I did point. I believe I pointed out that the local literacy plan, um, in addition to not being something that is required in statute right now, um, is a public school concept. And so, from from my advice to you, is that page four, line fourteen. The entire subsection G that's yeah. highlighted in green is just a policy decision for you all on whether or not you want to put in any language that talks about stakeholder engagement. And if you do, let's develop that concept. Uh, but but that's why this is highlighted in green is that we kind of flagged that this was something that may not work and it needed yeah. further discussion. And I guess I'm still slightly confused by what um, what this oh. mapping and stakeholder yeah. stuff looks like exactly. And I'm looking to the agency. John, I mean, I'm not sure exactly in this context, but generally speaking within the agency, what we'll do is, is kind of like advisory teams, right? We'll, we'll identify folks from the field, either licensed teachers, administrators, people within that crop, you know, experts in the field and come in and and for the most part, what we like to do, especially like speaking for myself primarily, is is really try to um, give them a lot of autonomy to guide the conversation and, and really get a good understanding of what you know the best practice in the field would be. Um, and then generate policy from, from that. So applying that, because we're talking about the local level, we aren't opposed to the idea of a requirement for stakeholder engagement. As a matter of fact, um, uh, well, we, parental motivation is slightly different, but we have, we've seen the um, language above, if you remember, we'd asked for some changes to the parental notification to make sure it's um, consistent with applicable law, state law and federal legislative intent that we appreciate that change. Um, I don't think we have a concern with low um, stakeholder engagement necessarily. The question was just whether you were um, wanting to require the local literacy plan. It seems like Beth has flagged that as a just a addition point about um, stakeholder engagement. Stakeholder engagement is something we're concerned about. If you okay. wanted to have a requirement that schools undertake that as part of literacy efforts, you could potentially do more general language. Um, okay, so part of this kind of tricky position is you guys have been here and yeah. over here and yeah. you're here. Yeah. It's not helpful. Because just to be perfectly honest, I speak absolutely on YouTube, but we've had bills that have been drafted and redrafted at your recommendations. So it's clear and concise uh, page as you guys can all get for coming over here would be really helpful. We we actually appreciate your uh your feedback on that. And it's certainly a major we we read without going too much into detail uh, I learned two important things. What one is we re we revamped our um, policy development process this year. There's been a lot of improvements, but some things have been rough. I also realized how important the month of July is for the legislative process because almost everyone who does policy work in the agency was doing flood relief work um, at the statewide level, unfortunately. So we missed out on some of that um, important time. 
so I appreciate your uh, committee's um, uh, forbearance on that. The only other thing to just note, and uh, um, I, Senator Hulick had, I, I'm uh, sensitive to her thoughts earlier about um, the about the need to move deliberately while still moving quickly. Um, one of the things you had asked us to just come back with some, uh, we had flagged some concerns about implementation. I still do think a lot of this has to do with bears on schools. So it would be worth maybe hearing from some of um, our, our school colleagues about what this would, how this would play out in the local level. Um, but one of the uh, couple of things that we we're thinking about that could be helpful would be, for example, a late, later effective date for universal screeners under section two, so you could move the effective date back. Um, one of the things is that the requirement um, um, in F on page four, um, just so at the, that highlighted section, the highlighted sentence where it says the agency shall develop a plan for parental notification or part of the subsection consistent with applicable state and federal law with its intent. You're not explicitly giving us a deadline, but that effective date is, if I, if I, I checked the moment of my research, it's on passage. Um, we won't be able to implement it in, in the, on that on passage or on that July one time frame. We could potentially do it for the fall. So you could um, give us a, I think I defer to um, that, but I think you would give us a session law section to with a with a date say of like November 1st or something like that to come up with a parental notification plan. Some of those things that would give us a little bit of time and also give the field some time to react would be helpful. Um, so you could potentially delay effectiveness of the section by by a year or something like that if you're thinking about kind of some of those things. Um, but other than that and a concern about um, just generally hearing from the field on this, we um, uh, that that's basically what we have to offer in terms of the implementation. We are noting in Figla, but it's worth doing to our conversation earlier. And you mean hearing from the field specifically, we've heard from the bees. Who else are you talking about? If you've heard from the bees and they haven't flagged concerns about this language, well, they don't like it. They don't. No, I mean, I don't think the NEA, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Bannon, I, but they had some concerns. Hmm. Okay. If you've heard from them and you've heard their concerns, then we were, we're coming. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. From our part, it's really just a question of we we are big fans of effective dates now and how how we are delivered of that work. So. Okay. Um, Great. Anything else for Ted or Andrew? Thanks. Thank you. Really appreciate it. We're going to shift to Holocaust education, and uh, we're going to take though about ten minutes until our we have Miss St. James back, as well as Linda Garcetz and Perry Handel. Welcome to Senate Education, and welcome back to everybody that's been uh, engaged in Senate Education. So we're looking at Holocaust education, uh, S eighty seven, and you I believe reached out to us wanting to give some testimony on on the bill. Yeah, so this is an area both personally and professionally I feel very passionate about. So, and since you're completely new, I think, to yeah. this committee, why don't we just go around and introduce ourselves so you know where we're all, our districts, that yeah. represent. So, oh, Senator Hashim, do you want to start? I'm not a machine for Linda Kelly, I think. Martine LaRocky, you look uh, Chittenden Central. Brian Newman from Bennington County. Dave Weeks, Rowland County. Terry Williams, Rowland County. Great. So the floor is yours. We're all Thank here. Thank you so much. And, you know, I had a meeting with my department this morning with the Global Studies Department at Montpelier High School. And this was uh, like someone else brought this up on the agenda. Um, and we uh, so these these points both come from myself, but also a consultation with the history department at NHS. So good afternoon, senators. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the proposed Holocaust Education Bill S87. My name is Perry Bell Hanselman, and I come to you wearing several hats. I am a social science teacher at Montpelier High School, where I teach 10th grade world history, a senior elective on social change theory and practice, and serve as an advisor to the, racial, uh, to the student led Racial Justice Alliance. I have worked as a high school educator for over 16 years and have many years of experience leading professional development training in Vermont and California on ethnic studies education, trauma informed practice, and Jewish history. 
I'm a Jewish Vermonter, a mother of Jewish children, and a resident of Middlesex, Vermont. I, myself, am a strong supporter of Holocaust education. I teach a six-week unit every year in my 10th grade class that examines the events leading up to the Holocaust, its implementation, legacy, and continued relevance today. Anti-Semitic, homophobic, and racist ideas continue to proliferate in our society, and in the recent decade have become more visible as white supremacist supremacist ideologies have resurfaced in mainstream politics. In the Montpelier Rockbury Public School District, we've had numerous instances of anti-Semitic bullying and vandalism in recent years. Holocaust education is one essential component of preventing the spread of this ideology. That said, I have three significant concerns about this bill as currently written. First, I would like to address the potentially negative consequences of mandating six hours of Holocaust education every year of the middle and high school grades. Foremost, this is not a trauma-informed approach to teaching this very sensitive material. The Holocaust is a triggering subject for many young people who belong to targeted groups. It can also be the avenue in which, white, in which supremacist, often white supremacist, ideas students have learned outside of school surface in the school community as has been the case in Montpelier. The Holocaust, like all other supremacist movements, must be taught deliberately by a content expert in a strong container with a trauma-informed approach in a proper historical context. As a mother, I do not want my children who are Jewish to sit through six hours of superficial tre treatment of this material over the course of seven consecutive years. Nor would I wish for black students to be forced to sit through lessons about racial slavery every year nor for indigenous students to study the history of European colonization annually either. Furthermore, from a learner perspective, it is also not helpful for this material to be repeated every year. As history teachers, we know that any time we cover the same topic on an annual basis, it begins to feel repetitive to students and loses its impact. Students begin to, just to add on, believe that they know everything there is to know about this topic and not be interested in learning more, even when that's very much not the case. A more appropriate pedagog pedagogical approach would be to touch on the Holocaust experience through humanities lens at some point in middle school and through a social science lens inside a global studies curriculum in high school. Secondly, I'd like to address the topics that are required to be covered under this bill. There are many key facets of Holocaust education that are missing, in my opinion. Topics that I and many other Holocaust educators believe are essential to understanding this history include the robust, militant, and creative resistance led by members of targeted groups, the personal risks taken by countless Europeans who acted in solidarity with targeted groups, the inclusion of socialists amongst the targeted groups, and the emergence of fascist, fascist ideologies as a response to socialist revolutions, the strategies used by the Nazi party to gain a foothold in German society, and the combined impact of indoctrination and economic promises. The use of anti-Semitism as a strategy for maintaining ruling class power throughout over a millennia of European history. The tactics empl employed during European colonization that were copied by the Nazis and implemented during the Holocaust. The, net the connection to the social construction of race and the eugenics movement in the United States, and I would really highlight eugenics as something that is really essential to any standards covering the Holocaust. The refusal of the United States to provide asylum for Holocaust refugees after World War II. The 10 stages of genocide framework in which we can understand the commonalities between the Holocaust and other instances of genocide in the world. When I introduce a unit on the Holocaust, my students have often heard of it, but have a simplistic understanding of what the Holocaust was, that the Holocaust was a result of Hitler's hatred of the Jewish people. As you all know, it is much more complicated than that. My students consistently share that what is most impactful for them in this unit can be summarized in four essential understandings, and this is what I get when I review student uh, reflections at the end of the unit. That the groups targeted by the Nazis fought back in whatever ways were available to them. And just this idea that people resist genocide as such an important understanding. That through systemic indoctrination, supremacist ideologies can quickly take hold in otherwise progressive societies. But the Holocaust is not a fluke of history, but rather deeply interconnected with the other events we study in modern world history, including histories of colonization, racial slavery, the emergence of industrial capitalism, and political revolutions of this time period. And finally, and so importantly, that, Holocaust, that the Holocaust was not an isolated instance, 
but rather one that we can use as a tool to help identify past and current examples of genocide around the world. I would urge these understandings to be at the heart of any Holocaust education curriculum. So my final concern with the bill as currently written is that by mandating Holocaust education, education and not genocide education more broadly, the bill perpetuates an anti-Semitic trope of Jewish exceptionalism, obscures students' ability to identify and intervene as the threat of genocide arises today, and minimizes the experience of young people, of young Vermonters whose families or ancestors experienced one of the many other genocides in recent history. Anti-Semitism stems from the same cause as all supremacist ideologies. That is, as a strategy of, do of a dominant group to maintain power through the dehumanization, subjugation, and scapegoating of targeted groups. Understanding anti-Semitism in the context of other genocides that have been perpetuated in recent centuries and that are happening today is a critical tool for young people unlearning the myth that it, there is something inherently quote unquote different about us as Jewish people. I am concerned that in making the Holocaust the only specific historical event that Vermont educators are mandated to teach, we will further the idea of Jewish exceptionalism. Further, in decontextualizing the Holocaust from other instance, instances of genocide, this bill also fails to fulfill the most important ethical lesson of the Holocaust, which is the importance of identifying and acting to prevent for future genocides. The 10 stages of genocide framework, as created by the NGO Genocide Watch, is used by scholars and human rights organizations around the world. It outlines common themes found across instances of genocide and attempted genocide, from the systemic dissemination of indigenous people and the system of racial slavery in the Americas, through the genocides committed in Darfur, Rwanda, and Bosnia in recent decades, to the current crusades waged this past year against civilians in, Ar in Arsa, the Congo, Sudan, and Gaza, to name a few. Most gravely, by de-emphasizing other communities that have been impacted by genocide, we risk sending the message to many of our most vulnerable students that their group suffering is less important. My strong recommendation to the Senate Education Committee is not to move forward with the current language in S87, but rather to develop a more inclusive genocide education bill that takes a global approach to understanding these histories and the current supremacist ideologies and violence in the world today. I would also ask that a committee be convened to write an updated bill that includes middle and high school teachers, historians, human rights experts, and Vermonters who are from communities that have been targeted by Thomas Island. Um, also, there are two points I didn't include in here that I just want to emphasize. Um, one is that, you know, as a teacher, when I have students come to my classroom, yes, they're understanding, they've heard of the Holocaust, but the range of understanding of what that means varies widely. Um, and, but the same can also be said for many other horrific instances in our history, uh, particularly racial slavery and colonization. It's really astounding to me and often astounding to my students how little they know about these histories um, before they take my class. And so I would just say, you know, in general, um, I read the Vermont NEA's testimony, you know, and they raised some concerns around mandating any specific content. And as a history teacher, I share those concerns, right? We're seeing this play out across the country, what the pitfalls can be of governments mandating what is included in social studies education. That being said, we have some pretty significant holes that I see our students missing in this state. Um, however, I think it would really be a mistake to single out Holocaust education amongst those and not more broadly address the um, histories, the painful histories that targeted so many marginalized and historically oppressed communities in this state that don't get taught in their full complexity um, and who um, don't, and that often aren't taught in a way that fully humanize the people that were targeted. And so again, like when I urge for a genocide education bill, it is within that context that there is much that needs to be covered. Um, and I think the Act One framework really does, you know, move us forward in many ways on that behalf, but I think a genocide education bill could be a powerful accompaniment to that too. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate being here today. Thank you. Uh, questions for Ms. Uh, fellow Hunt Hadleman. Senator Thank you. Um, could you give us a really simple 
brief example of what um, teaching of the Holocaust experience through a humanities lens might look like, and also through a social study, the global studies curriculum, just like, just tease out one little... Yeah, um, well, actually, yeah, so I don't teach in the middle school, and I apologize in blanking on the name of the book that the students read, but student, last year my students read a book on refugee experiences that looked at refugee experiences in the face of um, genocide and mass violence around the world and, and criteria that maybe doesn't meet the criteria of genocide, but is along the framework of the 10 stages of genocide. And they, it was all done through stories. So they looked both, and this was done, I believe, in the eighth grade class, where they read story uh, the story of a young man who was a refugee from the Holocaust alongside a refugee from Syria um, and alongside several other stories. So that's that's what I'm referring to, right? Um, project. It's project. Oh, God. It's right with a number. Yeah, I should have looked it up before yeah. I came here. No, I, um, yeah, right, or, or other material, right, that is age appropriate um, for, in our middle schools, right? And some schools engage with their brain, but looking more through the personal experiences of survivors and victims of these tragedies. I think that's what I mean by that. Whereas uh, by 10th grade, students are really able and have a higher just intellectual cognitive ability to contextualize what is happening in broader historical patterns. And I think that's a really essential component that we add in. I did hear early on some testimony, I think it was a quote from The Economist, that roughly 50% of young people aren't even aware of the Holocaust, so it's just incredibly disconcerting, as you can imagine. Right. I mean, those those statistics are also like astounding for many other parts of our history as sure. well, so sure. it's helpful to like take it in that context. Um, I can't pull the statistics right now, but it's not the only thing sure. that young fair, people are fair, fair, wildly yeah. ignorant about. Um, which doesn't always reflect that they haven't been taught about it, right? And that's one of the things we struggle with as teachers, right? You know, like I have kids come into my class and they've never learned about this, and then, oh, right, and then they remember all this. Um, but it, that, yeah, I, I completely yeah. agree. We have a need for Holocaust education, um, and I see that need here as well in Vermont. It would be great to have the statistics for Vermont, for Vermont too. So. Yes. How do you combat an anti-Semitism in your school? I, I, I talked to a parent this weekend. I heard that Burlington High School has had, has had a number of different issues yeah. related to this. Kids, um, and, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. How do you address this issue? We're like deeply in that conversation right now. You are? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, one thing that I have experienced since I've been in the state for five years and I came from the Bay Area in California and there's just a very different culture around responses to incidences of hate. Um, and often that looks like in what I've experienced, not just at Montpelier, but in many different districts, what I've seen in different districts, is it an effort to kind of avoid claiming an issue or to protect student privacy um, that we avoid talking about things head on? Um, I think that these need to be issues that our school districts take up, that mm -hmm. when there is a swastika mm -hmm. in a bathroom stall, that there is a robust response just like when there is hate speech against students of color or queer and trans students, disabled students, which we have happening on a regular basis in many of our districts. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think there's just a level of, A, just clear responses from the administration, um, administrations, districts, having more courageous statements, um, and clarity around these issues and that we need to take them on in our schools as well. I mean, and a key piece to how we address anti-Semitism to me though, is that we really contextualize it as a supremacist ideology that we do teach in, in my class. Like I teach very specifically what the root is, what 
is specific to anti-Semitism, just like what we look at, at it, what is specific to anti-Black racism, what the like historical reasons were that these were used as ruling class strategies and how that we kind of see those trends um, still present today, the remnants of those ideologies embedded in subtle ways in mainstream thought. Um, so to me, a like, very robust education is needed, which is the kind of thing that we need to outline in great, much greater detail within a genocide education bill, or that I know like that what working group has taken on as well. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, it's yeah. Well, um, I'm kind of drawing a parallel to what we were talking about earlier uh, regarding literacy and training around it and you know how, how we teach kids whether it's about the Holocaust or just global citizenship in general, which is a part of the education quality standards. And, you know, when we hear anecdotes that there are some teachers who just are skipping over the Holocaust and it's just anecdotes, but, you know, I mean, what's missing in the supervision there or, you know, or the review process for what's being taught in the classroom? Uh, and I, I, I don't have an answer but yeah, so I, that's I mean, that, that's just one of the things that I'm thinking about here. And yeah, and take it even uh, another step is just creating out how to have those conversations. So it's teaching, but if you're an administrator and there's a swastika on the bathroom wall, you know, how do we equip our administrators and others to deal with that in an effective way? Go ahead. Yeah, well, actually, the question for you is, you know, if there is a, if there was a, another history teacher in your school and, you know, they got to the World War II section of their curriculum and they just completely skip over the Holocaust, is there, you know, what would, what would happen to that teacher or even you know, any, can you provide any insight? Um, I know it's speculation, I'm sorry. No, well, I mean, it, it, it At our school, we we have a curriculum that myself and Colin Sullivan wrote, right? So it, it wouldn't that includes Holocaust education. Like we, as um, a department, have gone through and have identified all of the major historical moments that are going to be taught and and what both kind of content standards, skill based standards, and enduring understanding students need to have. So we do have that. I think that's like a critical piece for any history or ELA department to have. Um, I do think that is a question for the state. I do think that, that there are other places where there are holes in our curriculum. Um, and it's not clear what recourse, for example, I as a parent, even at the elementary school level, the elementary school that my stepdaughter attended and that my daughter will attend has very little in addressing any of the topics that have come up today. I don't know what recourse I have to address that. So I think that's the thing I would like the state to take on. I do think that's a place where Act 1 standards and a genocide education bill could be really critically important. Um, but I think to your point, um, the standards aren't enough. We really need training. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that there has been training provided um, in association with Echoes and Reflection. Uh, and I haven't attended those trainings myself. I've seen some of the curriculum, so I can't comment on, on those trainings. Um, but there's many different frameworks for teaching the Holocaust through. Um, Echoes and Reflection training uh, uses a definition of anti-Semitism that replace any criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism, and so that makes that a particularly challenging curriculum for some of us to work with today, and particularly as we're looking at trying to parse apart in our society a conversation about anti-Semitism and a conversation about Israel's policies as an active by Netanyahu. Um, and so it, there's, there's important considerations too in terms of where training happens. And so that's why I would also just think it's so important that there be a diverse group of educators and historians, um, human rights experts that would be part of creating these standards um, to, to figure out those complexities. Thank you.
Any other questions or comments? Yes, Senator Wayne. No, I, I thank you for your testimony. I, and I totally agree with you. I think that it should be genocide in general, not specifically one race or one, uh, one genocide. Uh, I mean, I don't even know how to talk about it. Because what's prevalent right now in the media is what's going on in Israel and Gaza. I don't want to offend that anything. Yeah. But I think that it's so important that we, you know, we get we get the education, we continue the, the message of what's happened in the past, or we don't have to repeat it. Yeah, and I think this piece of both deeply understanding the Islamism and deeply understanding genocide and how genocide takes place oftentimes as governments are grasping on to hold on to power. We need to be able to have both of those understandings to parse out our own country's role in current events, particularly in Israel Palestine right now and the Middle East at large. Like these are one of the most critical issues happening in the world and a lot of our ability to understand it has been obscured by not having this education. Did really your teacher education program prepared you for these conversations? Or was it through additional training that you were able to? Both and I, I did uh I um did my teacher preparation at um, San Francisco State University, which has an ethnic studies college, and so did get some of these frameworks in my teacher education, which I don't think has not been the norm in most teacher education programs. Then I did a uh, second master's at Antioch in trauma informed practice. And so those two things inform my lens, but that is another place to look like how are our educators getting us educated? It's in a week. Just wanted to thank you. Probably some of the most thoughtful testimony we've had in the committee. But uh, you, you raised uh, dozens of extremely valuable. And cause us to reflect. And it shows the complexity, I think, in part why generally this committee does not do curriculum. Um, mm -hmm. It is a standards process. And we'll hear a little bit from uh, Ms. Carsis around this. And if you're able to stick around, great. Yeah. We'd love to have you. Yeah, great. Right. Love to hear that. Any final questions or comments? Thank you. Yeah, great. thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Perfect. Ms. Carsis. Hi. Hello. Thank you. I apologize. Yes. I promised to send this, but my computer literally froze before I was okay. even, I couldn't put no the letter at all. So what, let me just frame this a little bit yeah. for you. Uh, you heard the testimony. We're trying to understand the best way to approach this issue. Uh, is there a way for us, for example, to direct the creation of a standard if we would want to move in that direction? But we know that you, through the ethnic studies process, has been in the thick of this work. And so if you would just say a little bit more, you've been in here to talk a bit, but about the process, the Act 1 framework, and how it addresses this issue. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I won't read, you already know, uh, for the record, I'm Amanda Garcet, Director of Policy Education Outreach for the Toronto Human Rights Commission and a former chair of the Act 1 Working Group. Um, so, yeah, I will just start by sharing that we believe that, you know, the inclusion of the Holocaust education within Vermont's public school curriculum and independent schools um, is really important. I just want to reiterate the charge of the working group, which was to review standards for student performance adopted by the State Board of Education um, and recommend to the State Board updates and additional standards to recognize fully the history, contributions, and perspectives of ethnic groups and social groups. And it had a list of how we need to, how these standards needed to be designed, which will increase cultural competency of students, increase attention to the history, contribution and perspectives of ethnic groups and social groups, promote critical thinking regarding history, contributions and perspectives, provide across its curriculum content and methods that enable students to explore safely questions of identity, race, quality, and racism and ensure that the basic curriculum and extracurricular programs are welcoming to all students. 
With that said, our submissions to the State Board includes both the Education Quality Standards and our IRIS Standards Framework, understanding that the State Board's authority is limited to adopting the standards. For student performance, we've aligned our work with this understanding. And so I want to extend right those driving this discourse forward. Um, it's universally acknowledged that teaching the Holocaust alongside other challenging historical events such as slavery, eugenics, and various genocides is essential. We do have at the state the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is looking at some of these topics as well. These events provide critical lessons in human rights, social justice, and the consequences of prejudice and discrimination. Our efforts, we believe, are already contributing to advancing Holocaust education. So here's how uh, the state board approved standards. So we submitted the education, the education quality is standards, and that includes specifically the need for ethnic study. Uh, that means interdisciplinary, age appropriate, grade appropriate curriculum, and programs dedicated to the historical and contemporary study of race ethnicity and indigenous peoples, including the indigenous peoples of Vermont, requires a critical examination of the experiences and perspectives of racial and ethnic groups and indigenous peoples that have suffered systemic oppression, marginalization, discrimination, persecution, and genocide within and outside the United States. Ethnic studies may involve a criminal examination of these experiences, and perspectives through the lens of the characteristics of social groups. So that was the definition uh, that was adopted or uh, voted by the state board in May of 2023. There might be some revisions coming in the pipeline, but that is our definition of ethnic studies. So with that framework, we created the IRIS framework. And the way that we see that the Holocaust can be incorporated as a classroom teacher is in four pieces. The guiding concept of transformative solidarity as a way of members of oppressed social groups to find common cause and anti-discrimination -discrimin work. So one is like the identity development, which explores the historical, contemporary, interdependent, and multidimensional nature of identity. So a teacher can use that. They can use interconnectedness, which is another one of our standards, to build one's purpose, anchor, and anti-racist anti-discriminatory in intercultural solidarity, social responsibility, co-creating cultural community spaces that center the healing from the effects of histor historic and contemporary trauma, harm, and toxicity rooted in racism and intersectional forms of oppression. And so like those were the four pieces that we came up with that the educators say to use. So in summary, there's more, and I will send this, but in summary, I recommend that adopting the strategies that line the outline, which you have in your report, um, that basically address the necessity for teacher training and curriculum development in subjects such as Holocaust education, slavery, eugenics, and other genocide. The success of ethnic and social equity studies in Vermont's public schools depends on the commitment and collaboration of educators to for professionals, administrators, and community members with sustained professional guidance and resources for edu educational agencies. The training program should aim to enhance educators' understanding of historical, pedagogical, and social content, as well as their proficiency in curriculum development and classroom instruction. To ensure success, it is essential to provide adequate time, resources, and support for educate educators foster partnerships with organizations specializing in these subjects and establish long-term professional development initiatives. Additionally, collaboration between school districts, educational agencies, and organizations experiencing curriculum design is imperative. Uh, so it's noteworthy that while many other states have already made Holocaust education a requirement, Incorporating a comprehensive approach to teaching about difficult history sets Vermont apart as a leader in inclusive and informed education. Now, I give you a, um, all the other states that have Holocaust education 
uh, which are include genocide. So Oregon, for example, requires the school districts to provide instruction about Holocaust and genocide, and the state for education develop academic content standards. California should offer courses in human rights issues with particular attention to the study of the humanity of genocide, slavery, and the Holocaust. Arizona require a uh, requirement that students be taught about the Holocaust and other genocides. Colorado shall incorporate standards of Holocaust and genocide studies, which means on the Holocaust, genocide, and other acts of mass violence. Nebraska required to adopt standards for education on the Holocaust and other acts of genocide. So I'll give you the list of all the 25 states that have that requirement. And most of them include the other reasons. One question. When you were working on things, who from the standards board was your contact? Who did you interact with? From the state board, you mean? Yeah, no, from the standards. Oh, so the standards board that develops the licensure? So we haven't worked. You haven't interacted no. with that. I mean, I'm on that board. You are on the board. Okay. And we are about to revise the, to enter into the process of re revising the standards for Vermont educators, mm -hmm. but that's a long process. Who's the chair of that board? That is uh, the amazing Amy Maynard, uh, who, who is a superintendent, and she is really great. I love that board. Okay. Yes, we have. Yeah, great. Yeah. Right. It's great. Any other questions or comments, discussions? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, early on in your testimony, I think you said the board is limited in accepting your standards. What did you mean by that? It was kind of early on. Uh, I just said that the board uh, that the the standards of the education. board sets the standards. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, they're, they're like the ones that adopt the standards. So all the content areas. It looks like better. The state board. The state board. Not just the understand. Yeah. And then at the end, I just, I, I made note of when you said difficult histories, I just, um, I don't know, I kind of wanted to flag that because I think there, there are some difficult histories and then there are some histories that are beyond difficult. And I don't have a term to suggest to you, but. Inhuman, inhumane yeah. histories. Like we, we, mm -hmm. we develop a lot. We spend a lot of time looking at the history of discrimination, genocide. We have a whole 32 page of all our resources. So that's uh, the same. And the, one, and the Act 1, if I look on the web page for Act 1, that's where it would be. Okay. Yeah, I will send you all of our, uh, of how we came out with the definition. Yeah. All of our research is there in a document, so like a 32 page document that explains where we research, what all of our research came. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, if you don't mind sticking around for a little no, bit. No, I'll be here. Thank you. So, Ms. St. James, do you mind joining us? Sure. So, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is the committee comfortable with not moving forward with S87 as written? Okay, I think that's your opinion. So, one so in your folders, one way to look at this issue, um, this was proposed by a Burlington parent who is committed to this issue, um, who contacted me over the weekend, uh, just as a starting point for another way to have this conversation, either in the miscellaneous education bill, and I'm not married to this, but just want to put it out there, um, it's really, a, and I'll have the St. James say a few words, but this is a, a data collection piece to understand what is being done in our schools around Holocaust education. I'll pass it to Ms. St. James to just give us a quick little overview. That's St. James Office of Legislative Council. Um, as your chair just mentioned, it requires, this language would require an agency of education to request from all supervisory unions, a report back with information regarding whether and where Holocaust education is taught in a supervisory union wide curriculum. And then included in the communication that goes out to supervisory unions requesting this information um, 
there's a requirement that AOE provide Holocaust education resources um, that need to be developed in consultation with the Vermont Holocaust Memorial. I will just say that um, I think the I think that the intent of what this language is trying to achieve is clear, but I may not have gotten all of I may not have used all the the right words as far as whether and where Holocaust education is taught. If there if this if you decide to go with this language. Um, I would encourage you to either have me behind the scenes or to take direct testimony on the very specific language um, to include to get the right information. So just throwing it out there as, as sort of a data collection, I'm looking to our most recent witnesses. Um, we know that there is real concern out there that Holocaust education is not being taught. Uh, this it one this would do a couple of things. It would give us a sense of the landscape out there. Uh, it also might allow people to pause and say, "Hey, wait, yeah, we're not doing it." Um, and then if they're not, or even if they are, there would be some recommend you know some additional resources that uh, the AOE would put out in this correspondence with the uh, to supervisory unions. Uh, some recommendations from the Vermont Holocaust Memorial. So I'm just looking to the two of you and if you have any thoughts on that approach or anything. Well, I would say that the Agency of Education did already a lot of resources and they, uh, it is my understanding that they work with Echoes and Reflection mm -hmm. and with um, the Holocaust Memorial to resource and align some of the current uh, content standards to Holocaust studies. So there's already a resource that I believe yeah. they developed. Um, I'm not sure what the data, you know, what you will do in the meantime. One thought is if an email, if you were to receive an email and you and some of these resources were listed, again, it might just make them a little bit more available. You might sort of pause and say, hey, this is an honest sense of long for teachers. Uh, while also collecting some data. Please. Yeah, I mean, personally, I would be fascinated to see that data. Mm -hmm. If you're, it would be fantastic just as a world history educator. I'd love to see that data, as I mentioned as well, for um, the his teaching of the history of racial slavery, European colonization and other genocides. I think you could solicit information on Holocaust, other genocides, racial slavery, and history of European colonization as some really key areas that have impacted so many of our students. Um, and yeah, I think that would be very helpful to see. Um, my only caveat with that would be, again, with the like sharing of resources, looking at perhaps providing a few different resources for Holocaust education. Uh, there's the Parseo Institute puts out uh, anti-Semitism and Holocaust curriculum that takes a different approach than Echoes and Reflection. And I wouldn't say not to use Echoes and Reflection. I just think it's useful for uh, teachers to have content that's coming from different political perspectives. It does strike me as a moment in time where it would be helpful to gather some of this information. Uh, and it may not even be something that we need to legislate, but ask the agency to do. I have a vague recollection of the agency being, I could be completely wrong, having been asked to gather this kind of information several years ago. And I think it wasn't in the legislative request and that may not have made it all the way. Um, I don't think we, they were able to execute it, uh, but they didn't. So committee, Senator Kulik. What do you think What's the uh, of the language proposed for this, this initiative, going about it this way in some regards? Should we use LDAs instead of supervisory unions? Supervisory union is the, um, I don't think you need to, it's, it's one of their duties to develop statewide or uh, SU-wide curriculum. Okay. So I don't think you need to use, that's a federal, usually a term that we're using like state requirements and who's responsible for what, but okay. the SU is a Vermont specific entity that one of their duties is curriculum. Okay. 
Yeah, so I, I think I mentioned this the other day, but I'll say it again. I was speaking with an educator in the Burlington School District who is Jewish, who understands that this can't really be a mandated curriculum and doesn't want it to be, but also said you could potentially go through K-12 in Burlington and not get Holocaust education. That is problematic for me. So what I would like to see maybe included with this is just more clarity around how the standards work, where the Holocaust education would sit in the standards, along with genocide. And I mean, we can, maybe there are other things we want to flesh out, but I would like to see explicitly where Holocaust education is supposed to be taught. Um, I think that would be information that would be really useful to us. And I also do think this is a good idea if we could make it happen as well. And it sounds like Jeannie Minor might be the one to help us with some of these things as the chair of the standards board. But that's the, it's, it's, it's. I'm not sure if the standards board is the body, it's okay. the state board of education that adopts the, the state standards for education performance and, and like education. The standards board, we're looking at teacher licensure and like what teachers need to be able to get their license. So that would be a good question to have right. around what are uh, teacher prep programs are teaching when they're given licenses in Vermont. That's like another another place where we need to have that conversation. It's like, how are we, for the new teachers that are coming in the pipeline, what are the resources they're getting around Holocaust and genocide in general? That's really helpful because I think we've all been grappling with where does some of this really fall? Okay, Ms. Zink and Reed has been. Um, yes, I, and I think we talked about this when you had me come in to talk generally about curriculum development. And I, I think so. My pitch to you all: <laughs> the best place to get this to to perhaps make the best attempt to, to understand this is to have someone come in and literally walk you through standards that have been adopted by the State Board of Education and Social Studies and World Languages. Um, which encompass the global citizenship content area. Um, it's likely that there are other content areas that would touch on this subject, mm -hmm. um, but I'm just thinking broad strokes and the time you all have. Yeah. Um, this would, understanding the content areas that supervisory unions are required to develop their curriculum to, may help you understand where things should be or are required to be um, and where there's any gray area. Um, and it, I, I don't know, you know, I, I, I think in the, the curriculum conversation we had, I, I sent you all a link to the content areas website on AOE and you can click through the standards and it will take you to um, a portrait of a graduate in world language, proficiency-based graduation requirements. It will, it, there's lots of resources that I am not competent to speak to, nor should you want me to, to speak to them. Um, but there, there are requirements that SUs are required to develop their curriculum to. And until you understand what that what those requirements are, I feel like we're going to have the same conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you may do that, or you may ask someone to do that, and they may tell you that I'm wrong, and that's okay. I am not the I'm not in the field, um, but when I am looking when I in my chair when I am looking to find the information that I need or the evidence that I need, I'm trying to track track things Probably. down to yeah. the, the the primary source, right? And so if you haven't looked at the primary source yet, that's one idea. Uh, Ms. Bello handle. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, speak to this for a second. The social studies standards that have been adopted by the state of California are the C3 standards, and I don't know if you all are familiar with those. Um, it's a particularity that many social studies teachers have questions about the choice of those standards um, because they're not, they're not so, they're, content skill proficiencies. 
right? So we have skill proficiencies in evidence analysis. You're talking about California. No, but we no. We, we also have adopted. Oh, we have adopted a C3. Right. Okay. Yeah. I said California? Yes, yeah, yeah, so I was sure. Okay. <laughs> talking about Vermont. Okay. Um, <laughs> we adopted this. California has standards, for instance, that are topic specific. So it will have a standard about Holocaust education. It will have a standard about World War II. It'll have it so on and so forth. Vermont does not have any such standards. Um, what we have are each school adopts elements of the C3. It might be research process. It might be source analysis. It might be civic engagement that are going to be implemented in their social studies curriculum. No specific content whatsoever exists as mandated in those standards by the state. So that's one piece of this. Yeah. Um, I saw for the first time in the NEA testimony mm -hmm. that they pointed out that there is somewhere on the standards website where a document has be been created that points to how Holocaust education can happen that's right. through the existing C3 mm -hmm. standards. I'm not, I was, I've never been shown that as an educator. So whether or not that's mandated, it's not something that social studies teachers are being provided with, um, at least probably not most of us. Sir Hashim just had his hand up. Yeah, I was just going to mention, I think, uh, I think data collection for this uh, is a good step. I think that it will be able to get an idea as to where the gaps are and I mean, I'm, my, my thought is, you know, if we see that there are teachers who, you know, are, are trying to teach history, they're getting to the World War II section and they're somehow skipping the Holocaust, maybe there's an issue there with training and mm -hmm. what they need to know. And so, you know, and again, I'm, I'm just thinking back to the this modules idea, you know, regarding literacy. Obviously, literacy is priority number one. You're not going to be able to learn about any history if you don't know how to read, really, but yeah, so no, I, I think getting an idea of where the gaps exist is a good first step, and then, you know, we can figure out how to move from there uh, as to, you know, what type of training might need to happen, and maybe I'm biased because I majored in international relations, but, you know, if you're not teaching the Holocaust, you're probably also struggling in other areas of teaching about the world, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you. So I agree with Senator Hoshim. I, I believe this is a this is a good tactic for data collection. I think the step that's missing is AOE needs to take that data and then come back with some recommendations. That's not in here. That step's not in here. That, and I, I believe that step's missing, but I, so I agree completely with what you said. But just to articulate what I think is uh, lacking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Senator Williams on this topic. Well, I mean, you know, we're not the curriculum committee for sure. So, uh, I like what uh, Ms. Bell Hamilton had her bold items on page two. Mm -hmm. Be a little more specific about what we expect. It's not. It's not just. Teach the Holocaust, but teach, you know, maybe a pared down list of the bullet items you put in there. And then, uh, you know, we need to decide if it's going to be taught in history or social studies. Or, um, and, I, and I agree with Senator Leakes that AOE should come back to us. Some recommendations after they do some data collection. Yeah. Okay. You're okay with the data collection as well. Would you mind adding that to the miscellaneous education bill? And as a coming back with some recommendations, so play with that a little bit, uh, Senator Gill. Thank you. From a circling background, I, yeah. So my question, I think I meant it as kind of a rhetorical device, but that's not how it came out. Which was just, are we okay with it not being taught? I mean, it, it okay. If it's not in, it's not explicitly in the standards. Are we okay with that? I guess is that was more like mm -hmm. what I was trying to get at. Uh, yeah. It's a great point. And as I recall, the AOV's testimony, it was there, but I'm not sure if it was in the standards. Do you remember Ms. St. James? I did not see that okay. testimony, but I also think something that we've been dancing around both last session and the session 
is the concept of proficiency based learning mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. and how those how those um impact yep. your discussion your understanding of the testimony that you are receiving and the log that you are writing because right now when we're talking about content areas <laughs> there is just one general line in title 16 that delegates authority to the state board of education to develop specific content areas yeah. that is it right so if you are concerned that those content areas are not adequate or you have questions about those content areas, I think understanding proficiency-based learning standards, concepts, what that means is going to be important on where you go. Because I think as your witness just said, um, it, huh, there's a different, and I, and I think, I think there's a difference between requiring content as in topics and the proficiencies that everyone is teaching to. Mm -hmm. Very different. And that's not coming for me. Yeah, no, we had a lot of conversation <laughs> last year on these proficiency because we'd heard from a number of teachers, including ones that work in this building, that things were not working well there. Please, yes, and, and I think the, the, one of the issues is that the school districts have the option to pick. Like, for example, from the C3, this is how many standards. These are the standards we're going to master out of the master list. And that, that's a choice, right, that uh, districts have. So that's a little bit of a gap in there because you might have different districts decide different things. And a lot of the social justice educators that I know that are doing this work of Act One already yeah. are using, for example, the C3 appendix. Yes. <laughs> Out of the C3 is <laughs> the, the common core. So they, there's an appendix that has a really great more opening to have these conversations with students. And that's what they're basing their thing in. So I think it's really important that also part of Act One, having these conversations, the whole idea of ethnic studies, which it will include all of these conversations, it's not the phrase like the one class like that. It could be an umbrella for literature to be thinking about genocide and the Holocaust, like all the other content areas too. That is not just limited to that. And that's how you expand the conversation across the content areas and how you like take something like the Holocaust, genocide, to be able to look at all the difference between how someone's reading to how you know someone is looking at the historical context, so. I don't know if I'm, yeah, you're an educator. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, so um, it's very helpful. We're gonna move forward with the language and miscellaneous education bill. We're gonna pause on S87 as written. We're gonna continue to look at standards. In fact, I'm gonna ask Morgan to re-submit uh, Bannon's testimony on this issue, just put it in our folders for tomorrow, just so we have that. Uh, and we'll go from there. Anything else for today from anyone? You're joining us for the first time, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to <laughs> point you out, but would you like to introduce yourself and tell us sure. why you're here? If you're uh, doing some hi, I'm Ruben McNeil. I'm an MSW student here, yeah. Uh, I'm usually here virtually. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Keeping an eye on our on our work. Yes. Great. Great. <laughs> Terrific. Can I say one more thing? Absolutely. Just to just to emphasize, I said it before, but I think if you are going to investigate the inclusion of the Holocaust, to ask teachers whether they address any other genocides just might be some really useful information as they understand how this education is being framed. You can return to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, uh, it's always great to hear firsthand from a teacher. So if there's ever an opportunity, if you, if you notice that there's something that we're working on and you or a colleague would like to weigh in on, please do so.